Before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Western observers were wary of its tank force. Russia had the largest tank fleet in the world with 12,556 units. This number was more than its closest rivals, North Korea and the United States, combined. Meanwhile, Russia's rival Ukraine had only about 1,900 tanks before the war began. The numbers looked hopelessly bad for the Ukrainians. However, numbers aren't everything, and the war in Ukraine proved it. In this video, we'll look at how Russia has lost thousands of tanks in its special military operation, how it deceived the world with its number of tanks, and how its tank failures have been systematic in everything from doctrine to design. Russia started the war with disadvantages. Despite its formidable tank fleet on paper, only about 2,600 of Russia's armored units were main battle tanks, defined as a heavily armored tank that is designed to provide direct firepower in head-on combat. For example, the M1 Abrams and its derivatives fit this role for the United States. Other armored vehicles like the M2 Bradley play important parts on the battlefield, but they are not designed to get into direct combat with enemy tanks or heavily fortified positions, so they are not called main battle tanks. To make matters worse for Russia, only about a quarter of its pre-war main battle tanks had modern sighting and fire control systems. These were the T-72B3, B3M, the T-80 BVM, and the T-90AM. Worse still, by November 2022, Colin Carl, the United States Undersecretary for Defense Policy, estimated that Russia had lost half of its pre-war main battle tanks in Ukraine. A year later, the Oryx blog estimates that Russia has lost a total of 2,478 tanks, with 1,621 destroyed, 139 damaged, 170 abandoned, and 548 captured. As a percentage, about 65% of Russia's total tank losses have come through the destruction of its armored units. Ukraine, meanwhile, has lost 689 tanks, with 462 destroyed, 56 damaged, 37 abandoned, and 134 captured. This makes for a Russia to Ukraine casualty ratio of 3.5 to 1. The ratio of tanks lost to destruction between Russia and Ukraine is also 3.5 to 1. However, Ukraine is suffering as well, as 67% of its total tank losses have been through outright destruction rather than damage or abandonment, comparable to the Russian figure. Experts note that Oryx's estimates of the equipment losses on both sides are often a bare minimum and the real losses are likely higher. Even so, the general picture would remain correct. Even though destruction percentages are similar, Russia is losing tanks at a more rapid rate than Ukraine, and many of the tanks that both sides are using have great flaws. Why have so many tanks on both sides been destroyed, compared to being merely damaged or abandoned? Part of the reason is that Russian tanks are prone to catastrophic damage. Unlike Western tanks like the Abrams, Challenger 2, and Leopard 2, Russian tanks do not compartmentalize their ammunition. Instead, some of the tank's shells are stored in the turret. If the tank gets hit, even indirectly, it can start a chain reaction that results in the entire magazine exploding, creating a jack-in-the-box effect so often seen in Ukraine. Some anti-tank weapons, like the American Javelin, are designed to send their projectiles on an arc that impacts the turret of an enemy tank, which has weaker armor than the body. The result is devastating. Russian tanks suffering from jack-in-the-box explosions did not come as a surprise to Western military experts. They had observed the same effect in the Gulf War, when large numbers of Iraqi T-72 tanks were totaled after their turrets got hit by anti-tank weapons. Russia's other supposedly modern tanks, the T-80 and T-90, have the same design flaw. The T-90 entered service in the Russian military in 1992, but its designers did not learn anything from the Gulf War. As of November 2023, the Oryx blog has estimated that, of visually confirmed cases, Russia has lost 1,270 T-72-type tanks across multiple variants. Of these, 815 have been destroyed, a destruction rate of 64%. Meanwhile, Russia has lost 669 T-80 tanks across multiple variants, with 419 of them being destroyed, making for a destruction rate of 62%. Russia has lost 92 of the different types of T-90. Of these, 55 have been destroyed, a rate of about 60%. Russia has also lost 285 other tanks that Oryx could not identify. Of these, 241 were destroyed, making for a staggering 84.5% destruction rate. 
While Ukraine has gotten much media attention for its newfound use of Western main battle tanks like the Abrams, Challenger, and Leopard, most of the units in its armored fleet are still Soviet and Russian-designed tanks. Before the conflict, it had about 900 Soviet-made T-64, T-72, and T-80 tanks. Most of these were of the T-64 class. Of these tanks across multiple variants, Ukraine has a total of 376. Of these 376, 241 were destroyed, a rate of 64%. Ukraine has also deployed different tanks of the T-72 class and lost 186 of them, with 132 of them being destroyed, a destruction rate of 71%. 56 Ukrainian T-80s have been lost in combat, 39 of them were destroyed outright, a destruction rate of 69%. In contrast, Ukraine has seen the destruction of just one of the 14 Challenger tanks it's deployed in combat. Meanwhile, of the 25 Leopard tanks that have become casualties in Ukraine, only nine have seen outright destruction, a rate of 36%. The others were damaged, abandoned, or both. This discrepancy in the destruction rate between Soviet, Russian, and Western tank designs is because the latter's militaries learned from the experience in Iraq. The Abrams, for example, has its ammunition magazine in a sealed compartment. One of the tank's four crew members retrieves rounds from this compartment, unsealing and resealing the magazine with each shot. This setup means that if the tank is hit, only one of its rounds is likely to be exposed in the turret. This can damage the tank, but the crew is relatively well protected from enemy fire, and there is far less of a chance of a chain reaction that produces the jack-in-the-box effect. Russia did seem to finally learn the lesson when it designed its latest tank, the T-14 Armata. Unlike the earlier Soviet-produced designs, the T-14 has an armored protected crew capsule, which is completely separate from the ammunition magazine thanks to the tank's autoloader. Unfortunately for Russia, only about 20 of these units have been produced, far from the 100 that were supposedly in the works with a contract announcement in 2020. Because of international sanctions, logistics, and perennial corruption problems in the Russian military, it's unlikely that Russia will be able to produce many more T-14 tanks anytime soon. Meanwhile, the Armata has never been definitively confirmed as participating in a combat operation in Ukraine. Claims that it has been deployed to the battlefield are likely based on Russian propaganda trying to save face and prevent their country's tank reputation from falling any further. It is likely that the Russian military fears losing the few Armata tanks it's been able to produce. For Russia, the lack of the T-14 Armata also means that it lacks a truly modern main battle tank. Even Russia's supposedly most advanced tank that it can produce in large enough numbers, the T-90, is still based on the T-72, a model which saw its genesis in the late 1960s. Aside from their superior survivability designs, one of the reasons that relatively few of the Western main battle tanks deployed in Ukraine have been destroyed is because their Russian opponents lack the firepower to threaten them. The T-14 Armata was developed with an improved 2A82IM 125mm cannon, which Western military experts conceded was a significant improvement over the guns on the T-72, T-80, and T-90, despite the Armata's other problems. However, this weapon is not backward compatible with Russia's traditional tanks because the breech block does not fit, meaning that the Kremlin cannot deploy it to Ukraine. If the Russians could find a way to field this weapon, the casualty ratio between Ukrainian and Russian tanks might not be so lopsided, but like in many other matters, Russia's poor preparedness for the conflict meant that this problem was overlooked. Additionally, Russia's tank guns have limited mobility. The T-90, for example, can only raise its gun to an arc of 14 degrees or lower it to an arc of 6. In contrast, the Abrams can raise its gun by 20 degrees or lower it by 9. This gives the Abrams greater range than its Russian competitor. The lack of mobility for Russian tank guns also makes them vulnerable in urban combat, contributing to Russian tank losses in Ukraine just as it did in Chechnya. So Russia began the war in Ukraine with a largely outdated series of tanks with design problems that made them prone to catastrophic destruction and ensured that they would lack range and firepower. Because Ukraine started the war with the same kind of outdated tanks, it suffered an armor destruction ratio comparable to its Russian adversary. However, as Ukraine received thousands of modern portable anti-tank weapons like the Javelin, it was able to pile up the damage on Russian tanks in other ways. Russia's staggering losses of its more modern tanks like the T-72, T-80, and T-90 have forced it to dig deeper into its tank fleet and break older models out of storage. The older tanks include the T-64 models that Ukraine has been using, 
which were designed in the early 1960s. Russia has also used the T-62 tank, the T-64's predecessor which saw its origins in the 1950s, and even in some cases the T-54-55, which had its genesis in the 1940s as a successor to the legendary World War II-era T-34. These old tanks have been deployed in Ukraine without any visible upgrades, such as bricks of explosive reactive armor to better protect them from anti-tank rounds. Perhaps it's for this reason that Russian sources indicate that the T-54-55 tanks in particular have been deployed more as mobile armored artillery vehicles designed for indirect fire assistance. This role seems corroborated by Oryx, as only two T-54-55 type tanks have been reported as visually confirmed casualties despite their lack of protective armor against modern weapons. One of the tanks was destroyed and the other damaged. Russian sources reported in May 2023 that the T-54-55 has been deployed to Ukraine at the company level. Like other tanks in Ukraine, T-54-55 models have been spotted with cope cages as an ad hoc method to protect against drones and anti-tank missiles. Russia originally wanted the T-62 and its variants in the indirect role that the T-54-55 has been deployed in, but the huge losses of T-72 tanks have forced it to usher in this old tank and the T-64 into frontline direct combat in larger numbers, putting it in the same position as its enemy Ukraine was at the start of the war. According to Oryx, Russia has lost 85 T-62 tanks across its multiple variants, 35 of which have been destroyed a rate of about 41%. Meanwhile, Russia has lost 78 T-64 tanks, 60 of which have been destroyed, making for a much higher destruction rate of about 77%. The destruction of so many Russian tanks in Ukraine has led to a peculiar phenomenon. As Russia is breaking its Cold War relics out of storage, its Ukrainian enemy is getting a steady supply of Western tanks, which are much more highly survivable and come with more firepower. For example, as damaged Leopard tanks get repaired, more could be coming from Europe in 2024. Germany has pledged that an additional 14 Leopard tanks will be delivered in early 2024 to replace the ones Ukraine has lost. Meanwhile, in November 2023, Germany and Switzerland made a deal to send even more Leopard tanks to Ukraine, adding to the latter's fleet, according to a report by David Axe in Forbes. In the late 1980s, Switzerland bought 380 PZ-87 tanks, which are variants of the Leopard 2A4. While Switzerland upgraded some of these tanks in the 2010s, it put 96 unmodified tanks in storage. Ukraine has long desired these. But Switzerland has centuries of tradition of being a neutral country. Then, on November 22, 2023, the Swiss agreed to export 25 of these tanks to the German Rheinmetall Company, which manufactures automobiles and arms. Technically, the condition the Swiss demanded is that these tanks must remain in NATO or EU territory to meet existing shortfalls. However, there is a loophole that the Swiss gave a wink and a nod to. Rheinmetall is empowered to sell these tanks to a country that already operates Leopard 2A4s, perhaps with German government financing, and that country could then donate to Ukraine its own Leopard 2A4s. So Rheinmetall could sell these tanks to Germany, for example, Germany would then be able to donate them to Ukraine. If these 25 tanks were to arrive in conjunction with the 14 Germany has already pledged, it would make up for the destroyed Leopards and then some, amounting to a new battalion of tanks. As Ukraine's tank force gets steadily more modern, Russia is finding it more and more difficult to replace its best tanks, and as a result, its tank force is getting older and more vulnerable to modern weapons. These older tanks are often not even able to fight at night, unlike the newer Western tanks that are coming into the service of Ukraine. This reality paints a grim picture for Russia as the war continues into its third year. It will need to rely more and more on throwing sheer numbers at the problems facing it. However, Russia's tank problems in Ukraine go far beyond old models and design flaws. While many tanks have been destroyed, many others have been lost due to capture or abandonment. Russian doctrine heavily emphasizes tanks and artillery. In comparison, Western doctrine emphasizes a combined arms approach to warfare. Urban fighting in Iraq helped to flesh this doctrine out. Tanks proved vulnerable without proper infantry support, especially in tighter environments like cities. As a result, dismounted infantry proved critical to supporting the tanks. 
Russia, on the other hand, learned nothing from its bitter experiences in the Chechen Wars of the 1990s, where guerrillas armed with anti-tank weapons would wreak havoc on the Russian armor from rooftops, high windows, or when emerging from basements. When Russia deployed its vast tank fleet to Ukraine, it again failed to provide its tanks with proper infantry support, learning nothing from its experiences in Chechnya. Long columns of Russian tanks without proper infantry support, often in urban settings, proved vulnerable to the ambushes of Ukrainian anti-tank crews. As we've seen, because of their tanks' design problems, many of Russia's best tank crews became casualties in the earliest phases of the war, when Russia's attacks stalled outside of Kyiv and every other axis except in the southern one that emerged from Crimea. Russian tanks typically come in crews of three, the commander, driver, and gunner. If we take the visually confirmed loss estimates by Oryx and multiply the 1,621 tanks destroyed by three, it would yield a number of 4,863 tank crews becoming casualties in Ukraine. Because Russian tanks tend to blow up in catastrophic destruction thanks to their design flaws, most of these can be assumed to be KIA. These numbers are only rough estimates. They may be higher or lower. Ukrainian sources claimed in the summer of 2023 that Russia has lost over 4,000 tanks in the war. Although because this information is coming from a warring party, it must be treated with skepticism. It is noteworthy, though, that foreign experts have often roughly agreed with Ukraine's figures. For example, Frederick Martins of the Hague Center for Strategic Studies said they were probable in an interview with Newsweek. Regardless, the loss of Russian tank crews has been high because of the thousands of tanks destroyed. Since Russia almost certainly lost thousands of its best-trained tank operators in the early stages of the war, it's had to replace them with poorly trained and motivated new recruits. Much like their mobilized infantry counterparts in places like Bakhmut, Russia's modus operandi has simply been to throw these amateurish crews and outdated tanks into the teeth of the enemy. Russia's problems go further. According to Oryx, at least 176 tanks have been abandoned and a further 548 captured. The real number is probably higher. In contrast, only 37 Ukrainian tanks have been abandoned and 133 captured, ratios of 4.75 to 1 and 4.1 to 1 in favor of Ukraine. Why have the Russians lost so many tanks to abandonment? One of the reasons is that Russia has had problems deploying retrieval vehicles into Ukraine. These vehicles are designed to recover immobilized or damaged armored equipment. The comparative lack of these recovery vehicles in the Russian military is nothing new and date backs to the Soviet era. According to Oryx, Russia has lost a total of 88 armored recovery vehicles. 39 of them have been destroyed and the rest damaged or abandoned. Ukrainian forces have often been seen targeting Russian recovery vehicles with drones. Each loss adds even greater stress to Russia's armed forces. Meanwhile, Ukraine is converting some of its older T-62 tanks into armored recovery vehicles to assist its newer Western tanks. Russian problems go deeper still. Many tanks have needed to be abandoned because of a lack of spare parts or proper mechanics to service them. A comparison with the US military might bring things into perspective. The US Army deploys about 10 support soldiers for every combat soldier to maintain smooth logistics. The Russian army in Ukraine has had far fewer support soldiers, with only about 150 in a typical battalion tactical group being in that category. Each BTG has about 700 to 900 soldiers. Russia, despite being one of the world's leading energy producers, has also suffered fuel shortages in Ukraine. Lack of access to rail hubs that it needs to move equipment and clogged roads have made it hard for Russia to keep its tanks fueled. Ukraine's HIMARS attacks on Russian fuel depots and other important logistical centers have only added greater stress to Russia's tank problems, especially with their constant lack of proper infantry support. In sum, Russia's tank failure in Ukraine is the result of all things coming together. Outdated Soviet-era designs make Russian tanks prone to complete destruction, especially against modern anti-tank weapons. Poor doctrine ensures that these tanks often lack adequate infantry support to prevent ambushes, a fact which is shown over and over again at the hands of Ukrainian soldiers armed with portable anti-tank equipment and drones. Finally, poor Russian logistics ensures that tanks often cannot be recovered repaired or fueled, which is why so many of them have been abandoned or captured. Russia may have had the world's largest tank force before the war, but it's lost its best tanks at a staggering rate. With events proving that they were not so great, after all, tanks still may be a formidable force on the modern battlefield. But without proper infantry support, 
they are vulnerable, and without logistical support, they are for all practical purposes immobile. Russia is therefore left with a rapidly aging tank force, which it's throwing en masse into an attritional meat grinder, hoping to bleed Ukraine out so it becomes too exhausted to fight any further. The traditional Russian way of war. What else do you think is responsible for Russia's huge tank failures in Ukraine? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, remember to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Russia has had many failures in Ukraine, but its naval shortcomings are likely the most humiliating. Can Putin find a way out of this constant humiliation? Here's the scoop. Before the war, experts were worried that Russia's Black Sea fleet would help it to overwhelm Ukrainian resistance. For example, they feared that Russian ships stationed in Crimea would launch missiles into Ukraine free of retaliation. They also dreaded the possibility that the Black Sea Fleet would assist in Russian amphibious operations, especially in an attack on Odessa, the third largest city in Ukraine. The success of such an operation would completely cut Ukraine off from the Black Sea and leave it as a landlocked rump state. In the earliest days of the war, these experts watched Odessa and the Black Sea Fleet closely. Their attention was probably better focused elsewhere because Russia's navy was, much like everything else in its military before the war, all talk and no show. Far from achieving naval supremacy in the war, Russia's navy has instead been effectively contained by Ukraine. What does this turn of events say about the Russian navy? In fact, the disaster did not come as a surprise to some experts, who had noted the decline in Russian naval capability ever since the fall of the Soviet Union. In this video, we'll take a look at the rather dilapidated state of Russian naval power. Ever since the days of Peter the Great in the early 18th century, Russia has aspired to become a sea power, often going to war to secure favorable coastline and ports. Unfortunately for Moscow, geography is its greatest enemy in its quest for naval parity with other great powers. Most of Russia's ports freeze over in the winter. Others, such as those in the Baltic and Black Seas, are contained within choke points. This geostrategic weakness has proven to be a big challenge for Russia historically, and the same is true for its war in Ukraine. The 1936 Montreux Convention regarding the regime of the Straits permits Turkey to bar warships from passing through the Dardanelles and Bosporus during wartime, cutting off transit between the Black and Mediterranean seas. Turkey invoked the convention's wartime provisions for the first time a few days after Russia initiated its so-called special military operation. The invocation meant that Russia could not reinforce its Black Sea fleet, and as a result, Russia's naval brass became much more careful about deploying its existing ships. Such caution helped to ensure that the Russian army and navy would prove incapable of properly supporting each other throughout the war. The situation in Ukraine is only the latest example of geography getting in the way of Russia's quest for naval power. However, the Russian navy has far deeper problems. Command structure is one such problem. The Russian navy has no single command making it difficult for Moscow to design and implement a comprehensive naval strategy and plan for new programs or updates to existing ones. Russia's navy has also suffered from a shortage of money, and much of the money that's been devoted to it has become misallocated due to corruption. Before the invasion of Ukraine, Russia's naval problems were getting more obvious. The fleet size has continually shrunk. Older ships are often taken to the scrapyard before newer ones can replace them. Because of this, Russia is slowly but steadily losing its naval presence in the Arctic, a region that China, with its expanding navy, is increasingly interested in, and even the Caspian Sea, where other post-Soviet countries are building their fleets. Russia's navy is aging too. The fall of the Soviet Union also caused the fall of much of the Russian shipbuilding industry. The end of the Cold War led to an end in the demand for many of the naval projects the Soviet Union had once required atrophying the shipbuilding industry further. Skilled workers retired or had to find other jobs. Institutional experience began to evaporate. Important manufacturing equipment decayed. The shipbuilding industry was also partitioned as a result of the collapse. For example, much of the infrastructure that created the engines for Russia's warships wound up in Ukraine, since that is where much of them were built in Soviet times. As of November 10, 2023, the Russian Navy has a total of 265 fleet units, and the World Directory of Modern Military Warships ranks it third in capability behind the United States and Chinese navies. 
Russia has 185 Fleet Corps units, such as destroyers, frigates, and corvettes, 58 submarines, 21 amphibious assault units, and one aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov. However, the Admiral Kuznetsov is indicative of Russia's deeper naval problems, so it's a case worth exploring. The aircraft carrier has been in dry dock for repairs since 2018, with the ship supposedly set to return to action in 2024. The repairs have been plagued by accidents and corruption. In 2019, a serious fire broke out. Two years later, the Director General of the Murmansk shipyard, where the repairs were taking place, was arrested on suspicion of embezzling rubles equivalent to about $600,000. Only one example of the widespread corruption in the Russian Navy we've mentioned before. Even if it were repaired and returned to action in 2024, the Admiral Kuznetsov would not help to change the situation in Ukraine for Russia's forces because it cannot be moved to the Black Sea. The Admiral Kuznetsov is also not a state-of-the-art aircraft carrier. Although it was built in the 1980s, which was around the same time as many of the Nimitz-class carriers in the US Navy's fleet, it does not operate with a modern catapult system like they do. Instead, it uses the STOBAR, short takeoff but arrested recovery, method. This means that it cannot launch its planes as rapidly as America's aircraft carriers, making it a less capable asset in power projection for Russia. The Admiral Kuznetsov is not the only less-than-modern ship in the Russian fleet. The Russian Navy's combined median hull age is 30 years. In comparison, the median hull age in the United States Navy is 23.3 years. At first glance, this would not seem too far behind, and it's true that the United States Navy has been collecting aging vessels. But as we will see shortly, America can fully replenish its fleets over a reasonable time. Russia has much deeper difficulties on its hands. When they have seen action, Russia's antiquated naval vessels have experienced problems in Ukraine. The most famous example came in the sinking of the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, the Moskva, in April 2022. Despite the Moskva's being an air defense cruiser, it sank when it got hit by a pair of Ukrainian Neptune anti-ship cruise missiles. Since the attack, observers have wondered how the Moskva's S-300F and 9K-33 OSA air defense missiles, its close-in 30mm cannons, chaff, decoys, and electronic warfare systems could have all failed to prevent the attack. Meanwhile, after getting hit, the Moskva did not prove survivable. It was a 40-year-old ship whose fire-extinguishing systems were outdated. Ukraine has also frequently used drone boats to damage or destroy Russian ships. On November 10th, Ukraine released footage of the drones at it again, attacking Russian landing ships. Footage showed at least one of them on fire in the water after an impact. Russia's navy has proven incapable of adapting to the demands of the war in Ukraine, and it appears that it will not be able to do so anytime soon. The sinking of the Moskva and other naval difficulties was a predictable result for some Russian military watchers who had been complaining that their country's fleet was aging poorly. Prior to the war, Putin had claimed that improving the Russian Navy's combat abilities was a priority of his. However, economic and logistical difficulties got in his way. Although Russia's defense spending increased under Putin, Russia has often lacked the manufacturing ability to modernize its armed forces. This lack of capacity would not be new or only confined to the Navy. Russia proved unable to manufacture the T-14 Armata tank or Su-57 Felon fighter jet in large numbers prior to the war. In many respects, the naval problems are worse because the Soviet Union's industrial institutions were never adequately replaced after they shrunk or vanished. Prior to the invasion, Russia had attempted to build new guided missile frigates of the Admiral Grigorovich class for its Black Sea fleet, but sanctions following Russia's unilateral annexation of Crimea prevented this from happening. In an irony, Russia needed engines made in Ukraine to propel these ships. In 2019, Russia had hoped to add 14 more of the supposedly stealth Admiral Grigorovich-class ships to its fleet, but only had the engines required for two of them. Russia tried to develop domestic gas turbine engines as a replacement for the engines Ukraine denied it, but has not yet begun production. In 2019, NPO Saturn, the Russian company tasked with manufacturing the engine for the new frigate, claimed that it had got its initial orders from the Ministry of Defense. However, sources quoted by Reuters at the time said that there was no guarantee about how many engines the MOD would actually buy. Ukrainian observers said that it would be at least five years before production of these engines began. Much more severe sanctions imposed since then will make the problem of building new ships for Russia's surface fleet that much steeper. 
Russia has also had a problem maintaining its existing surface fleet. The fire on the Admiral Kuznetsov during repairs in 2019 was only one of the many accidents and episodes of mismanagement that the Russian Navy is prone to. For example, the Kara-class cruiser Kerch caught fire in 2014 under mysterious circumstances. A shipyard fire in 2016 damaged a new minesweeper that was under construction too. And if you thought the repairs to the Admiral Kuznetsov were slow, consider that the Soviet-era nuclear-powered cruiser Admiral Ushakov had been idle for nearly two decades before 2019, when the Russian naval brass finally decided to scrap it. Russia originally had plans to modernize all of its Kirov-class nuclear-powered cruisers, but in 2012 announced that it would do so on only one of them, the Admiral Nikimov, scrapping the others. This is all part of a trend. The 265 fleet units in the Russian Navy as of 2023 is a sharp decline from the 360 ships that American observers believed it had on hand in 2019. That year, Russia saw the delivery of 23 new surface ships, a fact which brought a lot of fanfare in its homeland. However, just seven of these were armed combatants. The others were small missile corvettes that displaced no more than 2,000 tons of water. Displacement matters. One of the more accurate ways to measure the true power of a country's navy is through its combined tonnage. Heavier ships can not only carry more weapons and absorb more damage, but they can also stay at sea for longer. For example, the United States builds large warships because they often need to travel thousands of miles from ports in the homeland to reach their destinations and perform their worldwide missions. Heavier ships can carry more fuel and other supplies. Lighter ships are more vulnerable, less powerful, and can stay at sea for a limited amount of time. This is one of the reasons why American experts are not overawed by China having the world's largest navy by total vessels. Most of the Chinese ships are light and would fare poorly in a direct confrontation with the United States Navy. Now, as Russia steadily retires its Cold War era fleet, it is increasingly facing the same problem that China has, a fleet of small vessels with limited displacement. For example, Russia has built new Bayan and Bayan M corvettes. However, these supposedly new ships lack anti-air and anti-submarine capabilities. They are also small and incapable of operating far from the coast. The new Karakurt-class ships are better able to operate in deeper waters, but they also lack anti-air and submarine capabilities. In 2019, the Russian Navy displaced a total of only 1.2 million tons. The United States Navy displaced 4.6 million. The gap has grown further since then as a result of Russia continuing to retire older, heavier ships and replacing them with lighter ones. The result is that Russia has an aging surface fleet increasingly in need of repairs and unable to modernize despite the increase in defense spending. Meanwhile, the newer ships being delivered to the Russian Navy are not adequately replacing the ones being scrapped. Russia's surface fleet is getting smaller, less capable in battle, and less able to project power over long distances. We've seen that firsthand in Ukraine, where Russia has been unable to establish naval superiority in the Black Sea west of Crimea despite its opponent having no navy. Russia's ships are too old, vulnerable, and incapable of supporting amphibious operations. To make matters worse, the new ships seem to have little strategic purpose, which expects any confrontation between it and the United States to take place in the waters of the first island chain close to its territory. There is rationale behind building smaller vessels that can operate close to bases on the Chinese mainland. For Russia, however, this rationale does not exist. Because of its geographical isolation from the world's waterways, it needs larger ships if it is to project naval power abroad. However, Russia is steadily losing its Blue Water Navy and is increasingly contained to the less-than-ideal waters near its coastline. Russia's submarine fleet appears to be better off than its surface vessels. For example, it's in a much better place than China, which still lags far behind in underwater warfare. Of Russia's 58 submarines, 37 of them are nuclear-powered, 11 of these are ballistic missile submarines. 17 of them are conventional attack submarines, and 9 are cruise missile submarines. The other 21 submarines are less modern diesel-electric attack submarines. However, just like the surface fleet, Russia's submarine fleet continues to shrink in size. The current force of 58 submarines is a downward trajectory from the 61 that Russia had in 2015, and its precipitous decline from the 366 submarines the Soviet Navy had in 1985. Although much of the reduction in fleet size had to do with the end of the Cold War, Russia has lacked the money needed to build new submarines to replace the older ones reaching the end of their service life.
For example, it needed to scale back the production of its Oscar II-class nuclear-guided missile submarines and Akula-class attack submarines. The lack of funds delayed the more modern Yasun-class attack submarines too, with the first one taking 20 years to build. Only two of them exist. Russia's diesel-electric submarines, the Kilo-class, have proven easier to build, thanks in part to international exports to countries like India. India has 12 Kilo-class submarines in its fleet, domestically called the Shishuma class. However, in 2013, one of these caught fire and exploded, raising questions about the viability of its design. Just as Russian tanks are becoming a less popular item for international buyers, Russia's naval designs are facing the same problem, further depriving the Kremlin of the money it needs to modernize its military. Russia's submarine fleet has played almost no role in the war in Ukraine. Instead of missiles from Russian submarines hitting Ukrainian targets, the opposite has proven the case. In September 23, Ukraine launched Storm Shadow cruise missile attacks on the Russian Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. A Russian submarine was one of the targets hit in this attack. Are there ways for Russia to make up for its growing naval disadvantages? To cover the shortfall in domestic industrial capacity, Russia has considered importing naval engines from China, but that's a prospect which comes with its own shortfalls. China's military technology is questionable at best, and in the face of international sanctions following the invasion of Ukraine, such orders will make Moscow even more dependent on Beijing. China could drive a hard bargain in Russia's pursuit of a modern navy. Russia is also trying to create new domestic ship designs that will help to mitigate its shortcomings. However, these seem to lack proper coordination. The Russian Navy has been designing three different frigate and five different Corvette-class ships at the same time with little coordination. The lack of a unified naval command is playing a part here, and the competing projects are draining money from the Navy's coffers instead of allowing it to concentrate on the best design. One might consider it a worse version of the United States Navy's literal combat ship program, which saw two different designs drain money from other, more promising ways it could have been used. Russia has had hopes for Project 23560 LIDA, a large destroyer which supposedly could, if built, adequately replace the Udaloy or Sovremeni destroyers, which are typically over 30 years old. Project 23560 LIDA is also supposedly capable of replacing the Russian Navy's four Slava-class cruisers, the youngest of which is the 25-year-old Pyotr Veliki. The Russian Navy designed the LIDA to be a competitor for the United States Navy's stealth Zumwalt-class destroyers, which began commissioning in 2016. The LIDA was first unveiled in March 2015, as the Zumwalt program was ramping up in America. However, the LIDA-class destroyer remains theoretical. In 2021, sources claimed that construction would begin in 2023, but this has not happened. There were rumors that the program had been scrapped, with it being dropped from the Kremlin's 2025 state armament program. Sources in Russia's shipbuilding industry then noted that the program had not been scrapped, but funding for it had been reduced. And as we've seen, because Russia lacks shipbuilding infrastructure, it could take decades for the first LIDAR-class destroyer to be completed, even if construction starts. As a result of these problems, Russia is stuck with trying to modernize its existing destroyers, which, as we've seen, is a daunting prospect on its own. If Russia could update the ships adequately, such as outfitting them with modern sensors, they could theoretically stay relevant. However, given the Russian Navy's history of corruption, shortage of money, and demonstrated poor planning, that's not a prospect one should be excited to bet on. The inability of the Russian Navy to bring the LIDAR-class destroyer to reality for institutional problems and lack of funding is an embarrassment for the Kremlin, but it's part of a common historical thread that spans beyond Russia. Maintaining and modernizing military forces is and always has been an expensive business in money and institutional energy. Historically, this reality has meant that most nations have needed to concentrate on either land or sea power. For example, the United Kingdom spent heavily on the Royal Navy during its imperial century, but only kept a small, although very capable and professional, land army. Russia may have long sought to be a sea power, but its geography has dictated that priority must be put into its land forces. It may have pretensions to the contrary, but post-Soviet Russia does not have the resources to build up a top-quality navy. As we've seen in Ukraine, it will need to concentrate on its army even more, as it will emerge from the war depleted of men and material. Increasingly, a navy is a luxury that Russia cannot afford. But what do you think about the state of the Russian navy? Is there anything the Kremlin can do to turn the situation around? 
don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. When you're trying to conquer one of the largest areas in Eastern Europe, a little over 233,000 square miles to be exact, which is roughly the size of Texas, and you're running low on tanks, trucks, artillery pieces, aerial drones, and trained military personnel, you can be pretty sure you're failing miserably. Add an increasingly evaporating number of military aircraft to the equation, and it's time to hit the panic button. Be it land or sky, Putin just can't seem to hold on to his weapons. And it's not just embarrassing, it's downright self-destructive. In the case of aerial warfare, it is disastrous. For Russia, of course. Here's the thing. Air power should have been Putin's biggest advantage in Ukraine. When Putin's invasion began in February of 2022, experts and analysts were seriously gloomy about the smaller country's ability to defend its airspace. Most assumed that Russia's much-vaunted air force, the VKS, would be able to quickly overwhelm Ukrainian air defenses and gain a decisive early advantage in the conflict. Even the most optimistic assessments assumed that Russia's air campaign would destroy Ukrainian jets on their bases, while using large-scale ballistic and cruise missile strikes to blind the country's surface-to-air missile radars. This would have forced Ukraine to move its SAM systems away from the front lines, leaving it at a severe early disadvantage and increasingly vulnerable to Russian sorties. But these predictions, often from top conflict analysts, proved to be completely wrong. In more than a year of war, Russia has utterly failed to establish air superiority, while managing to lose staggering quantities of its jets and other assets. In fact, the situation is so bad that earlier this month, one pro-Russian blogger on Telegram, usually cheerleaders for the invasion, stated that the country's air force has engaged in complete idiocy and is detached from reality. Definitely not a good look for Putin. So how has this colossal embarrassment happened? As usual, there's no single answer here. But like other aspects of Russia's failure in Ukraine, it has a lot to do with the long-term issues plaguing the country's military. Corruption, bad strategies, poor training, and more. These certainly aren't new issues, but the war in Ukraine has exposed how much they've come to affect Russian capabilities. To get a better picture of how this has happened, let's start with a super quick look back at both fighter jets and air defense systems from the starting point of the most exciting eras in aircraft development the Jet Age. The so-called Jet Age kicked off in the late 1940s, spurred by profound changes in the field of aeronautics. The jets developed during this period could fly faster, higher, and farther than older piston-powered aircraft. This would soon come to transform the aviation industry in both its commercial and military forms. By using the technology of jet propulsion, many pilots believed they could outrun their enemies in the skies and theoretically create total air superiority. Using jet propulsion, aircraft could vastly increase their speed, a major reason why aircraft-mounted guns were mostly replaced by missiles. By far the most reliable way to shoot a supersonic jet out of the sky. Still the go-to weapon for aerial combat today, aerial missiles also revolutionized the nature of air defenses. Today they rely almost entirely on surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs, to prevent hostile attacks from the sky. And from the 1970s onwards, it also became possible for infantry troops to take down aircraft with their own portable handheld anti-aircraft missiles. These man-portable air defense systems, or man pads, are highly cost-effective shoulder-fired rockets able to lock onto aircraft using infrared homing. They are also easy to use, able to be taught to new recruits in a matter of minutes or hours. And since the start of last year, Ukrainians have shown the world just how valuable man pads can be. As Putin's invasion began, Western nations assumed the Russian Air Force would be among the most significant challenges for Ukrainian defenders. When Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov visited Washington in November 2021 to press for weapons, he reportedly told American officials, We have to prepare now. Point number one is air defense. So NATO members sent thousands of man pads into Ukraine to shore up the country's surface-to-air capabilities. Among others, these weapon transfers have included American-made Stingers, high-velocity British Star Streak missiles, and even surplus Soviet EGLOS systems. And this decision really paid off. These comparatively cheap air defenses managed to stop Russia from obtaining air superiority by imposing asymmetrical costs on any Russian pilot dumb enough to enter Ukrainian airspace. For example, using one 60 to 80,000 EGLA missile, Ukrainian soldiers have been able to down a $36 million Su-34 bomber or an $85 million Sukhoi Su-35S fighter jet. This huge cost differential has had effects across the battle space in Ukraine. 
Because modern combined arms warfare is highly dependent on air support, Russia's failure to dominate the skies has had serious repercussions. The inability to provide sufficient air cover for its tanks, infantry, artillery, or supply lines is one of the reasons Russian forces have taken such devastating losses. Caught in the open, these troops have been falling prey to a range of Ukrainian ambushes from hidden positions on the ground. But does the failure by Russia to achieve air superiority mean a lack of Russian aircraft? Kind of, but not exactly. Ukrainian troops near the front lines around Bakhmut have told reporters that Russia continues to fly daily sorties in hopes of catching their targets unaware. Most of these flyovers last only moments. Russian fighter jets or bombers, often flying in groups of four, fly at low altitude over a target area before quickly dropping or firing their payloads and hightailing it back to their bases. Less maneuverable attack helicopters will also fly right up to the line of combat before firing their missile salvos and quickly fleeing to safety. Another reason for this is the recent addition of the powerful Slovakian S-300 missile defense system to Ukraine's arsenal. This longer-range surface-to-air missile can target Russian jets at higher altitudes, forcing them to fly lower to screen themselves from attack. And in turn, the lower-altitude flights have made them extremely vulnerable to shoulder-mounted missile systems. Because of the medium-range S-300s and shorter-range threat posed by Ukrainian manpads, no Russian air assets are able to spend extended periods of time near the front. Despite the obvious difficulty of shooting down even a low-flying aircraft, the Ukrainian strategy seems to be working pretty well. One report from mid-May 2023 suggested that Ukraine had downed four aircraft in a single day of fighting. While Ukrainian commanders would not confirm their role in the attack, the country's defense ministry stated that the Russian craft ran into some trouble. Numbers like this highlight the focused and effective use of manpads, with soldiers using constant vigilance around the clock to exploit the tiny 3-5 second firing window. Ukraine's surprising ability to contest its airspace was also partly what allowed it to go on the offensive late last year. Some of this was done with Turkish-made Beraktar drones, which were used to destroy high-value targets like Russian surface-to-air missiles. This strategy, one that Russia has failed in executing itself, allowed Ukraine to launch more attacks from the air without fear of being shot down. Ukraine also used what limited air power it had in some very creative ways. During the sinking of the Russian Black Sea flagship, the Moskva, Ukraine used a drone to distract the ship's anti-air capabilities before launching a salvo of Neptune anti-ship missiles before the unlucky crew could react. Other tactics have included dispersing aircraft and air defense units out of major airfields, vacating certain air defense positions before they could take any losses from Russian fire, and operating their air defense SAM batteries as pop-up units, rather than large batteries with support vehicles. This final tactic proved to be extremely valuable stopping Russian forces from effectively targeting most of Ukraine's air defenses. While we now take for granted that Ukrainian soldiers will find creative and deadly ways to use its lesser capabilities, it is still no small feat. In fact, the creative use of air power highlights that Ukraine may now have a better understanding of air operations than even many NATO countries. David A. Deptula, a retired U.S. Air Force lieutenant general, has argued that the West can actually learn from Ukraine here. We've become so dominant in the air that we've never had to think through how we would use air power if we were the inferior force," he said. Ukraine is posing us some very interesting questions that we should seriously consider, if only to understand how a clever opponent would take us on. Russia, on the other hand, has continually failed to learn from their abysmal performance in the skies. And as with so much else, Russia's systemic failure to establish air superiority also points to the larger issues within the country's military. This became noticeable early on in Ukraine, when rather than overwhelming force, only one or two aircraft at a time conducted strikes against targets in and around Ukrainian cities close to the borders, including Kyiv, Kharkiv, Sumy, Chernihiv, and Mariupol. And when pilots missed their targets, they very rarely mounted follow-up strikes. At that same time, Russian military planners apparently made no plans for large-scale bombardments of air defenses themselves. In fact, they have seemed entirely unable to coordinate the large, complex formations necessary for fighter jets and helicopters to cover each other from enemy fire. More than almost anything else, this helps explain Russia's baffling inability to establish control over the skies, despite its qualitative and quantitative advantages. Western air forces have long taken for granted the ability to coordinate the timing and positioning of their attacks in campaigns like the Balkans, Iraq, or Libya. However, the level of planning, logistical, and command and control capacity needed for such air campaigns is massive. 
Every pilot needs to coordinate and understand their role in the broader operation, including the exact timing and route needed to strike multiple targets. Tanker support is also critical to ensure refueling can take place at established rendezvous points. The complexity only increases once actual combat begins, as various fighters tasked with destroying air defenses, those engaging enemy aircraft, bombers, electronic warfare escorts, and search and rescue teams must all work seamlessly together and adapt at a moment's notice. Russia has failed on basically all of these fronts. Many Russian pilots are trained to fly exclusively in pairs or fours, with little exposure to larger maneuvers or formations. They also get far fewer flying hours than NATO crews, do not have tanker support for most operations, and are not trained in large-scale aerial combat doctrine. Lacking all these elements, it's no wonder that Russia could not carry out a Western-style air war against Ukraine. And even in the instances where the Russian Air Force scored victories against Ukrainian positions, they were unable to capitalize on those strikes due to fear of man pads and larger surface-to-air missile systems. When Russia refocused its troops in the Donbass region during April of 2022, they were able to gain some localized air superiority near the new front lines, mainly through the use of artillery strikes against Ukrainian SAMs. But even when they were actually able to gain this limited control of the skies, Russia utterly failed to turn it into any type of concrete battlefield advantage. As one analyst from the London-based Royal United Services Institute or RUSI put it, the primary reason for this is that despite having more than 300 modern fast jets with theoretically flexible capabilities to carry a range of air-to-air -air and air-to-ground munitions, most Russian aircrew have very limited opportunities to drop precision-guided munitions in realistic training scenarios. Another major factor is actually hitting their targets, as many of Russia's jets do not have targeting pods, a standard feature on most Western military aircraft. In fact, while Russia's Su-34 fleet of jets have forward targeting systems and can use precision guided munitions, they're just about the only ones. The rest of Russia's fighter jets have very limited capability to identify and destroy any battlefield targets which do not show up on radar. This means they've pretty much been limited to attacking fixed targets with satellite or TV guided weapons or dropping unguided bombs and rockets at predetermined coordinates. One observer noted they are literally cratering empty fields, while an anonymous official from the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency told reporters early this year that under half of all Russian missiles are hitting their aim point. We're holding Russian missile success at just below 40%. In Donbass, this incredibly poor performance has meant Russian jets cannot effectively support ground operations, leaving troops open to a range of ambushes and other tactics. But how did the Russian Air Force end up in such a sad state, especially when Putin ordered a modernization of the fleet just a decade ago? The answer, as with so many things in Russia, seems to be a product of the country's structural issues. While the modernization was supposedly intended to make modern combined force operations easier, it appears to have been mostly for show. One part of this has been inefficiency and widespread corruption. For example, in 2012, one Russian arms company received nearly $26 million to develop an aircraft system for intercepting non-strategic missiles. But the research never actually happened. The company signed the fraudulent contracts with shell companies, the addresses of which were registered to the addresses of public toilets in the Russian city of Samara. In another case from 2016, one company responsible for supplying radio navigation equipment and control systems for guided munitions had a similar scandal. Its top leadership were caught in an embezzlement scheme where they faked research and development techniques in order to steal millions through fraudulent contracts. This type of corruption is common and widespread, also reaching beyond Russia's military-industrial complex and into the top levels of its political elite. So much personal wealth is on the line that some experts argue it has completely changed the incentive structure for Putin's top officials. Most of these individuals own property far beyond their official levels of income, signaling a range of corrupt deals. In turn, these security officials have less incentive to give actual expert advice, which could disappoint Putin and lose them access to their sweet kickbacks. And as mentioned before, poor training and an inflexible command structure compounds these issues. As Phillips O'Brien, professor of strategic studies at University of St. Andrews, has written, though much was made of the flashy new equipment, such as the much-hyped Su-34 strike aircraft, the Russian Air Force continues to suffer from flawed logistics operations and the lack of regular realistic training. Above all, the autocratic Russian kleptocracy does not trust low-ranking and middle-ranking officers 
and so cannot allow the imaginative, flexible decision-making that NATO air forces rely upon. So when Russian pilots actually have a chance to act flexibly and change their attacks to hit something, bad commanders and rigid doctrine do not allow them to improvise. Instead, they have to try to pull off their standing orders, even if those are likely to fail or lead to their untimely demise from Ukrainian air defenses. It really doesn't look like the situation will get better for the Russian Air Force either. The VKS has shown no sign of changing tactics and seems very hesitant to even use its best jets in the field. This might be because Western sanctions have hit the Russian aerospace industry particularly hard, quickly eroding Russia's ability to obtain the components needed to produce new advanced fighter jets. This became evident in a January call where Putin publicly attacked Denis Mantharov, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Trade and Industry. Previously a favorite of Putin, Mantarov was humiliated when he explained that the country was unable to obtain the contracts needed for new parts. One Moscow-based defense analyst even told reporters that you have to ask yourself if Mantarov is going to be the next one of Putin's cronies you read about mysteriously falling out of a window somewhere. But the corruption, sanctions, and mounting losses of aircraft in Ukraine seem to have made actually getting the parts an impossible task. This is pretty obvious when we take a look at Russia's three production facilities for Sukhoi aircraft. Despite their massive size, analysis from last year shows that they only produced 31 aircraft during 2022, falling far short of the orders placed in state defense contracts. Essentially, as RAND Corporation analyst John V. Paracini recently put it, Russia's aerospace sector isn't likely to have aircraft to sell, even if it wants to. At the end of March 2023, Ukraine's Armed Forces General Staff claimed at least 305 aircraft had been destroyed since the start of the war. While Russia has reportedly even resorted to stripping the microchips from household appliances to replace its losses, it isn't nearly enough. One Ukrainian defense executive stated that production for some of the most critical subsystems for Russian fighters has almost seized up. Problematic items like the Su-35's Irbis Passive Electronically Scanning Array radar antenna can require a year or more and that is in times of no embargoes, no supply disruptions. These problems are even greater for Russia's fleet of bombers, such as the Tupolev Tu-95 and Tu-22M3. While Russia has maintained some domestic production capacity for its fighter jets over the years, mainly due to demand from abroad, this isn't the case for bombers. Once the current fleet begins to break down, there is literally no way for Russia to replace them. This is one of the main reasons why many analysts and experts now call Russia's equipment losses in this area irreversible, with no chance of restoring stockpiles to pre-war levels. The situation for Russia's air force is also likely to get worse once Ukraine begins receiving the Western F-16s. Retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Dan Hampton stated in a recent interview that compared to an F-16, the Russian Su-35 is essentially junk, adding that our planes are more durable. I wouldn't bet in combat on the Su-35 or any Russian-made aircraft. F-16s are versatile, multi-role combat aircraft, which come in one- and two-seater models. Since 1979, the F-16 has been continuously upgraded, giving the newer models advanced radar and other capabilities. With a top speed of 1,500 miles per hour, a 33-foot wingspan, and 50-foot length, Hampton points out that the F-16 is very hard to see because it's smaller than most aircraft, especially when it's aimed directly at you. Each also has one M61A1 20mm multi-barrel cannon and can carry six air-to-air -air missiles. While this payload can pack a serious punch, the Russian planes should also be deadly, if used correctly. The Su-35 is a twin-engine, single-seat fighter jet, which the RAND Corporation has called Russia's signature heavy fighter bomber. While the Su-35 is reportedly faster than the F-16, able to reach Mach 2, it does not have the same powerful active electronically scanned array radar, making it a more vulnerable and obvious target. Colonel Hampton has pointed out that the Su-35 is easy to use, easy to pick up on radar, and easy to shoot at with a long-range missile. Part of this is because it's such a large plane, with a 50-foot wingspan and a length of nearly 70 feet. And as Hampton stated, the Su-35 is a typical Russian machine and looks good, but deep down it's not really that good of a plane. But which jet is actually superior? Well, it really might come down to who is using it. As David Jordan, co-director of the Freeman Air and Space Institute at King's College London pointed out, that on paper, it can be argued that the Su-35 has an edge over the sorts of F-16s the Ukrainians are likely to get, but that doesn't tell the whole story. 
Like anything else, the effectiveness of each jet will depend largely on its pilot, their training, and the tactics they employ. Seeing as Ukrainians have already held their own so effectively, there is reason to believe this won't change soon. Combined with their use of man pads, Jordan has argued that I would suspect that the F-16s in Ukrainian hands will represent a formidable challenge. Other experts suggest that the context in which a battle occurs will determine how well the F-16s stack up to the Su-35. Retired British Royal Air Force Commodore Andrew Curtis told Newsweek that if it comes to dogfighting, the F-16 is still one of the best in the world. However, the Russian pilots are likely to try and fight a standoff battle using medium and long-range missiles. If they can do this successfully, that may tilt the balance in the Su-35's favor. But regardless, it seems unlikely that Russia will be able to achieve more than the brief localized air superiority it held last year. Since Ukraine's capabilities are only growing, with more and more Western support, there is little chance of Russia making any real gains. With Russia hemmed in by man pads and other surface-to-air systems, and unable to replace or make more of their advanced jets, it seems only a matter of time before Ukraine starts to retake the airspace in its east. So, to sum things up, it has truly been a terrible year for the VKS. The war in Ukraine has exposed its fundamental weaknesses, while sanctions and enormous losses have seriously harmed its future outlook. Unable to even use the advanced jets it currently has correctly, Russia's air force is not likely to see any improvement soon. Ukraine, on the other hand, has been able to adapt and use superior tactics to overcome its numerical weaknesses. Once the Ukrainian Air Force gets its hands on some F-16s, the tide of war may turn even faster. But what do you think? Why has Russia's Air Force been failing so badly? And will Ukraine continue to hold its own in the skies? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe for more military content. As of June 2023, Russian tank losses have exceeded a whopping 4,000 since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. That is a lot of tanks, and Putin's troubles don't end there. Russia will have a manpower shortage very, very soon unless Putin orders another wave of mobilization. But Ukrainian losses have not been insignificant either. So far, Ukraine has managed to constantly mobilize their soldiers and replace their losses. But how long before they start running out of manpower too? Will Putin run out of troops before Ukraine does? Let's hear what our military experts have to say. In February 2023, word got out that a treasure trove of classified US documents had been leaked across the popular social media platform Discord. In those documents were some harsh assessments of the future of Ukraine's counteroffensive against Russia, who had begun their full-fledged invasion a year earlier in February 2022. The more than 100 documents included secret and top-secret files on foreign intelligence, analysis of opponent forces, and briefing documents for US military and government officials. One file in particular stood out. In its pages, the source claimed that Ukraine would be faced with significant force generation and sustainment shortfalls, and the probability that any Ukrainian offensive in 2023 would result in only modest territorial gains if not supported by a sufficient number of troops and hardware. This report was not the first time Ukraine was challenged on whether they had enough men to defeat the vastly larger country of Russia. It's been evident for some time that both Ukraine and Russia have seen a decline in their populations. For Ukraine, the 2014 invasion of the Donbass region and Crimea initiated their population decline. Their population loss has significantly increased since the February 2022 invasion, coupled with the indiscriminate bombing of civilian areas and brutalization of any population that didn't evacuate. Russia, despite having a vastly bigger population, has a vastly different problem. It's huge aka hugely embarrassing losses of hardware. Russia's hardware problems in comparison to its troop losses are perhaps a more reliable indicator of just how bad the war has been going for them, since tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, trucks and artillery are big and bulky. Their losses are harder to hide and can be counted and identified more easily than individual soldiers. When analysts look at hardware losses Russia has suffered, the numbers are simply staggering. An analysis done by the Ukrainian general staff reports that Russian armed forces have lost over 3,900 tanks, 7,600 armored fighting vehicles, 6,400 unarmored vehicles and fuel tanks, 3,700 artillery systems, 600 multiple rocket launch systems MLRS, 350 air defense systems, more than 300 planes, 300 helicopters, 3,200 drones, and 18 ships. To put this all into perspective, Russia was believed to have only around 3,500 main battle tanks before the invasion. The best estimates 
were that they invaded Ukraine with a total ground force of around 150,000 soldiers. An update on June 21, 2023 from the same Ukrainian source suggested that the number of lost Russian tanks has just exceeded 4,000. While the estimate from Ukraine might be biased, those from neutral open-source group Oryx are not. They count only those weapon systems for which they can prove beyond a shadow of doubt that they were destroyed or captured, and document each and every loss in their figures. They report as of June 13, 2023, Russia has lost, at a minimum, 2,070 tanks, 894 armored fighting vehicles, 2,454 infantry fighting vehicles, 318 armored personnel carriers, and thousands more mine-resistant vehicles, transports, mobile artillery, air defense systems, and various intelligence, supply, and command vehicles. Since Oryx only includes confirmed losses, even they admit Russia's real losses are much higher. There are several indications of how bad Russian material losses are. One of the most glaring is that Russia has been transporting 70- and 80-year-old tanks from storage yards and even museums, and sending them by rail to the front. One such relic was a T-5455 that was packed with around 6 tons of explosives and sent trundling to the Ukrainian front lines, though it was blown up before it could reach them. That tank was built a few years after the end of World War II. Others just like it have been photographed heading towards the front lines from all over Russia. Another surprising display occurred during the 2023 May Day Parade through Red Square in Moscow. Normally, this was the yearly event when the supposedly mighty Russian military would parade its newest and most powerful military vehicles, from tanks, IFVs, and multiple launch rocket systems to portable ballistic missiles, all of them overflown by frontline fighters and strategic bombers. But this year, the world received a surprise, when only a single World War II-era T-34 tank trundled through the parade. President Vladimir Putin was mocked around the world for such a weak display of supposed Russian military might. So it's pretty clear at this point that Russia is indeed running out of tanks, but does it have enough troops to defend its own cities? Even more embarrassing for Putin was the abortive March for Justice that his one-time chef and military oligarch Yevgeny Prigozhin launched for a brief 24-hour period from June 23rd through 24th. Prigozhin's private military company, the Wagner Group, was able to capture the major city of Rostov-on-Don without firing a shot and weren't met with any substantial ground opposition until they were within 125 miles of Moscow itself. The only thing that apparently stopped Prigozhin and Wagner was the failure of a popular uprising to join him. He certainly wasn't stopped by any military units. Most analysts believe that's because the vast majority of Russian military strength is all in Ukraine. Additional shortages of men and material have been seen in the Russian oblast of Belgorod, where a series of cross-border raids launched by free Russian opposition units, together with a small number of Polish expatriates fighting for Ukraine, have caused havoc for weeks. The minimal border security forces there have been wholly incapable of stopping them, not until they were supported by heavy artillery and air force strikes. Some reports say that the Russian defense units didn't even have weapons or ammo, since according to Russian law it was illegal for them to carry firearms. What about the regular troops? Now that we've seen that Russia has suffered a probably massive loss in hardware and material, and doesn't even have enough troops to protect its own borders, we can better understand the level of their actual troop losses and possible remaining strength. According to the same Ukrainian general staff report mentioned earlier, Russia has lost a staggering 213,000 killed, wounded and missing soldiers, sailors and airmen. That analysis includes more than 43,000 killed in action and over 170,000 wounded, many of whom will not be returning to combat. The Independent Center for Strategic and International Studies CSIS, has come up with an even higher estimate. Their report from February 2023 indicated that Russia had lost as many as 250,000 total casualties. In comparison, this total from just the 12 months of fighting is more than all the combat losses Russia and the former Soviet Union had suffered in all their wars since World War II combined. The estimate of 250,000 casualties would have increased by an additional 60 to 70,000 casualties between February and June of 2023. In just the first three months of the invasion, Russia suffered as many casualties as it did during its entire 10-year war in Afghanistan. What's worse is that according to the most recent reports, their casualty rate may be increasing. Russia lost over 1,100 troops in a single day on June 8th, as Ukraine has begun to hammer Russian forces with its summer offensive. But what's causing such high casualty rates? 
One of the biggest causes of such casualties is the outdated method in which Russia is conducting the war. Overall, the Russian military doctrine has changed little since World War I. They rely on masses of inaccurate artillery supported by fighters that perform ground attack roles and masses of human assaults, sometimes, but not always, backed up by tanks. But the Russian Air Force, known as the SVS, has seen high losses as well, due to the large numbers of surface-to-air missiles sent by the US and NATO members. They've been reluctant to fly over Ukrainian territory and prefer to lob bombs from the safety of Russian-occupied territory. Russian doctrine also suggests that if the first human assault fails, keep sending in more troops until the defenders fold. Britain's Defense Intelligence Agency points out that such outdated tactics carry with them enormous losses. Their report states that a combination of poor, low-level tactics, limited air cover, a lack of flexibility and a command approach which is prepared to reinforce failure and repeat mistakes has led to Russia's high casualty rate among its troops in Ukraine. But here's the really bad part. These casualties primarily include the vets and the elite. Indeed, one of the most significant areas where Russia's casualties have had a telling effect has been in their elite units. An example of the losses such elite units have suffered can be seen in the current state of the 331st Guards Airborne Regiment, a part of the 98th Guards Airborne Division, one of the best trained and most experienced combat units Russia has available. Prior to the invasion, the 331st Regiment's size was around 1,500 to 1,700 soldiers. It sent two battalion groups into Ukraine at the start of the invasion on February 24, 2022, for a total of 1,000 to 1,200 men. They suffered heavily in the initial day's effort to capture Hostomel Airport, just outside of Kyiv. The lightly armored infantry vehicles that they were sent in with proved no match for Ukrainian anti-tank weapons and heavy artillery. An estimated 94 soldiers, almost 10% of their strength, were killed in just the first few days of fighting. By the end of the year, some accounts indicated their casualties numbered more than 500. Continued fighting showed that the unit was unprepared for the length of the war. Within just a few weeks of the invasion, locals back at the city of Kostroma, where the unit was based, were holding fundraising drives to send the troops warm clothes. The governor of the region, Sergei Sitnikov, a former CO of the 331st, commented a few months later that we need to help our guys so they have decent conditions. When he visited the wounded survivors, he bought with him care packages from relatives back home and civilian drones bought on the open market. If the conditions were this bad for one of Russia's most elite units, then it can only be much worse for the regular army troops. These same high casualty rates have been reported for all branches of Russia's armed forces, but since the best trained, most elite units are the ones that can be most trusted in a fight, those are the ones that can see the most intense combat, often spearheading assaults in battles around Mariupol, Bakhmut, and as we've seen with the 331st, the initial drives on Kyiv. The problem is, as Russia loses a significant portion of their combat veterans, they're being replaced with less well-trained and less skilled replacements. For a while, the Russian regular troops were supplemented by Prigazin's Wagner forces, widely regarded as some of the most experienced urban fighters Russia had left. But Prigazin's abortive march on Moscow resulted in him being exiled to Belarus, and his Wagner troops being split up between joining him in Belarus, signing contracts with the Ministry of Defense, or returning home to Russia. The Wagner forces had been responsible for the only sector where Russia had made any kind of incremental gains since the opening months of the invasion that being around the area of the eastern city of Bakhmut. According to the U.S. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby, who spoke to reporters on May 1, 2023, Russia had lost nearly 100,000 casualties in its 10-month siege of Bakhmut, including about 20,000 soldiers killed in combat and 80,000 wounded. Ukraine have lost about one-fifth as many in its defense of the city, according to U.S. intelligence estimates, or around 4,000 killed and up to 15,000 wounded. It was clear that within the first few months of the invasion that Russia had failed to allocate enough forces for the complete subjugation of Ukraine and had vastly underestimated the number of casualties they would suffer. In September 2022, Putin announced a mobilization of 120,000 new troops, while a law was also passed making it a crime for anyone in Russia to call the invasion a war. Those 120,000 weren't enough, however and further conscriptions raised the total to around 300,000 by the end of 2022. These nationwide call-ups have had a serious negative side effect. On top of losing a quarter of a million men as casualties of war, as many as one million additional young men and women have fled Russia to avoid the conscription. Many of those who left are the young professionals that Russia desperately needs and cannot replace. 
These emigres have left for various reasons, but their primary reason was to escape the mobilization, along with fleeing the Western sanctions that have caused enormous economic distress within the nation. This has led to a significant manpower shortage across Russia. In an intelligence update released on May 27, 2023, the British Defense Ministry observed that a survey conducted by the Russian Central Bank involving 14,000 employees had determined that Russia's national labor force was at its lowest recorded level since 1998. In addition to losses from the war and emigration to avoid the draft, the survey also showed that the Russian population had previously decreased by up to 2 million in the years between 2020 and 2022 due to several factors, including the poor Russian response to the COVID pandemic, poor healthcare and diet, excessive alcoholism, and an increasingly aging population. Nowhere has this lack of workers been more acutely felt than in the tech sector, where shortages of trained workers have hit the electronics and programming sectors hard. This brain drain, along with continuing Western sanctions, has caused what Laura Solanko, a senior advisor for the Bank of Finland, described as reverse industrialization. This means Russia has not only seen a shrinking of its economy, but has had to replace overseas investment, lost due to Western sanctions, with funds supplied by the state. Solanko reported such policies can only succeed with huge investments in domestic production to replace lost imports, as well as the construction of new transportation links to the east and south. As resources are limited, she continued, this implies less investment in other sectors, including potentially more productive areas. Russia's investments will continue to move away from the technological frontier, she said, which is why she considers Russia's current state of the economy as reverse industrialization. These factors combine to indicate that Russia will have increasingly fewer young men and women for Putin to draft in 2023, if he feels the need to repeat his previous mistake. On top of Russia's potentially catastrophic combat losses and manpower shortages, Russia is also facing another area of concern, the loss of their combat leadership. One of the most widely reported problems regarding the Russian army is a distinct lack of unity of command. Part of that problem is currently due to the combat losses which extend up the chain of command. As of November 2022, Russia had lost more than 1,500 officers in the first nine months of the war, according to estimates by Ukrainian Colonel Anatoly Stefan, and backed up by studies done by the US Center for Naval Analysis. These reports suggest an estimated 160 of those 1,500 lost officers were generals, major generals, and lieutenant generals, as well as more than 150 colonels and lieutenant colonels, 250 majors, 296 captains, and nearly 500 senior lieutenants, in descending order of rank. While confirmed numbers, as with the lost Russian hardware, suggest a much lower number is more likely, it's clear that whatever the actual total is, Russia is losing far more officers of higher ranks than most Western armies would under similar battlefield conditions. As noted previously, one of the few areas where Russian military has been successful is with its private military companies, like Wagner, but there have been highly publicized clashes between Prigozhin, Wagner's leader, and the Russian military leadership in Moscow. Prigozhin has complained on multiple occasions that his private military group's needs have not been met. Meanwhile, whenever a high-ranking officer from the regular Russian army was fired, Prigozhin has been hiring them and adding them to his own private army, further distancing himself from Moscow. Prigozhin's march on Moscow was responsible for another loss for Russia. General Sergei Sorovkin, the deputy commander of the Russian group of forces fighting in Ukraine, disappeared from public sight following the march and was rumored to be under arrest for knowing about Prigozhin's plan and not informing Putin. Sorovkin's disappearance will be keenly felt across the entirety of the Russian military, as he was one of the most reliable ground commanders in the army, having attained his rank through skill and accomplishments unlike those above him in the Russian chain of command who owed their position due to loyalty to Putin above all else. We've seen the many problems Russia is having with its troop losses and its population decline. How well is Ukraine doing in filling out its army? Ukraine has exceeded all expectations in lasting more than a year against a country nearly 30 times its size in area, 17 million square kilometers versus 603,000 square kilometers, and more than triple its size in population. 143 million versus 43 million for Ukraine. That widely accepted estimate of the Ukrainian population of roughly 43 million is contradicted by other sources. According to statistics compiled by England's The Economist newspaper, Ukraine, including Crimea and the Donbass, has lost about 16% of its population between its independence in 1991 from the former Soviet Union 
and the eve of the 2022 Russian invasion. These numbers suggest that Ukraine now has a population of only about 36 million, compared to around 52 million in 1991. But that's to be expected in a country where the invader, Russia, has indiscriminately attacked civilian population centers and has leveled whole cities, like Mariupol, which has seen its pre-war population of 400,000 reduced to less than 5,000. This same Russian effort to depopulate any area of resistance has been repeated across whole regions of Ukraine. According to the Joint Research Center of the European Economic Union the EU, Ukraine will continue to see a steady decline in its population over the next 20 to 30 years, even under the most optimistic of circumstances. The JRC has estimated that by the beginning of February 2023, around 5.3 million Ukrainian civilians had been displaced internally across Ukraine, while approximately 7 million had emigrated to other countries, with around 4 million of those fleeing to nearby EU countries, especially Poland. This means that the invasion has displaced close to 30% of the entire Ukrainian population, both inside and outside of Ukraine. That accounts for the disparity between the pre-war estimates of 43 million for the Ukrainian population and the more recent 35 to 36 million figure. It would seem then that Ukraine could be facing a shortfall of the younger demographic that usually makes up military service recruits. However, those numbers belie the reality that an overwhelming number of volunteers have flooded the Ukrainian army, more than they can adequately train and supply. Since the beginning of the invasion in February 2022, Ukraine has seen a truly heroic response not just from within its own borders, but from abroad as well. An estimated 2,000 to 3,000 foreign fighters are believed to be serving in three battalions of a Ukrainian unit named the International Legion, according to analysts and academics monitoring them. But because the Ukrainian government wishes to keep such numbers private, these numbers are only best guess estimates. In the early months of the war, Ukrainian officials estimated that as many as 20,000 volunteers from more than 50 countries had arrived to help fight against the Russian invasion. But according to analysts and interviews with many of the foreign fighters who stayed, the vast majority appear to have returned home before the summer. Hundreds of the better-trained volunteers have since then been integrated into smaller units that operate independently of the International Legion. These groups, led by longtime regional opponents of Moscow such as the Georgian Legion and Chechen battalions, as well as other primarily Western units with names like Alpha, Phalanx and the Norman Brigade. Some of the volunteers who stayed are being used to train young Ukrainian recruits, though their training is often rudimentary. Where a Western nation like the US would spend up to 10 weeks of training in boot camp, the Ukrainian recruits often get as little as 3 to 5 days, though most will get around 2 to 3 weeks. It's not just the total number of troops that Ukraine has that should be considered, but also the troops who are trained well enough to survive the most dangerous first few weeks of their deployment. It's also clear that the numbers of Ukrainian men and women who volunteered were more than the Ukrainian army could train early in the war. More than 140,000 Ukrainians, mostly men, have returned from Europe. According to a social media post by Ukrainian Defense Minister Oleksiy Reznikov from March 2022, tens of thousands joined the territorial defense forces. According to the Ukrainian Interior Ministry, between 9 and 12 new assault brigades, totaling 40,000 men, have been training for months to help spearhead the current counteroffensive. Their numbers were swelled by countrywide media campaigns that called on young Ukrainians, both men and women, to join up to help rid their country of the Russian invaders. One of the leaked assessment documents from February 2023 titled Russia-Ukraine Assessed Combat Sustainability and Attrition, compiled by the US Defense Intelligence Agency, suggested that Ukraine had suffered as many as 130,000 total casualties, including 17,000 killed in action and another 113,000 wounded. Ukraine has been very tight-lipped about their own casualty figures, so these numbers are merely best-guess estimates. Overall, it can be seen that Ukraine does have less population from which to draw its military recruits, while sustaining very large losses over the first year of the war. Offsetting this has been a continued strong volunteer effort from both inside and outside Ukraine. The violence that Russia has unleashed on the Ukrainian civilians has convinced many in Ukraine, who would normally let others do the fighting, to step up and join their country in defending against the Russian invaders. No matter how long this war goes on, whether for months or years, it doesn't appear that Ukraine will run out of highly motivated volunteers anytime soon. The original question, will Russia run out of troops before Ukraine does, seemed at first to be an easily answered question. With three times the population, 
it would have appeared that Russia would simply be able to wear down Ukraine over years of relentless grinding warfare. But the reality is Russia's military is on the brink of collapse. Their best units have been shattered, and their ranks have been filled with ill-trained, poorly supplied, and poorly led conscripts. Their once vaunted dominance in tanks is now just a memory, and their artillery is being outfought and outshot by more accurate and longer-range systems supplied by the West. Russia's air force can't gain air superiority over the battlefield, while Russia's economy is so drastically damaged that they simply cannot replace the losses they've suffered in high-tech weapons. Ukraine appears motivated enough and well enough equipped that, if the war were to last another year or another ten, they'd never run out of people willing to fight to remove the last Russian occupier from their land. But what do you think? How close is Putin to completely running out of soldiers? Will Ukraine continue to be successful in replacing their short-term manpower deficit? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. When you break down the T-90 on paper, Russia's most modern battle tank looks pretty fierce. Among other high-tech accessories, it boasts a 125mm smoothbore gun, modular composite armor, and a 1,000-plus horsepower V12 diesel engine. In theory, it offers excellent mobility, protection, and firepower, along with the ability to launch armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding sabot rounds and anti-tank guided missiles. The T-90 also has several variants and has been a popular export due to its relatively high cost-to-benefit ratio. Then why, you might be wondering, has the T-90 been such an epic failure on the battlefield? To be fair, it's not just the T-90s that are dropping like flies. As Russia's war with Ukraine continues, since February last year, the Russian Armored Corps losses have since reached more than 2,100 tanks. That's around two-thirds of the tanks Russia initially rolled out of Moscow on their way to Kyiv. Russia has lost so many tanks, in fact, that they've had to reactivate and deploy hundreds of older models, including the T-72 Ural, T-62, and T-5455, some of which are 50, 60, even 70 years old. And most of these have headed to the front without any meaningful upgrades, not since the collapse of the Soviet Union anyway, to their optics, fire control systems, or armor. It probably wasn't the first choice, one could imagine, of the boys back at the Kremlin to roll out these older models. This decision likely has something to do with the recent spike in losses of their prized T-90s. In total, Russian troops have been forced to scrap or abandon nearly 60 of these 53-ton, three-person tanks, roughly 15% of Russia's pre-war inventory, with most being lost in only the last few months. But wait, aren't these supposed to be the baddest tanks around? That's certainly what the Kremlin's been saying. Before we get to the specific factors contributing to the T-90's proposed survivability, or lack thereof, let's take a moment to address one other important point. When we zoom out, there's an argument to be made that the increasing number of T-90's being destroyed on the battlefield in Ukraine might actually be a negative sign of things to come for our friends in Kyiv. How's that? Well, let's look at it like this. One reason that so many T-90s have been destroyed recently, but certainly not the only reason, is that there's been more of them deployed to destroy. Translation: Russia's current production of T-90s has been picking up, as Putin's nearly two-year effort to boost tank production finally seems to be paying off. Apparently, Russia has been able to work around some of its increasingly tighter foreign sanctions, including those on critical high-end electronics that it was once importing from France. As mentioned before, the number of destroyed or captured T-90s accounts for roughly a quarter of Russia's pre-war inventory. This overall number, however, does not include the hundreds that have been produced by the Ural Vagonzavod plant in Svedlovsk Oblast since the start of 2022. Russia's increased productivity could become a serious problem for Ukraine, considering its main tank plant, the Malyshev factory in Kharkiv, currently lacks the capacity to produce new tanks from scratch and is limited to performing upgrades and repairs. This leaves Ukraine's armored forces mostly reliant on foreign donations if they intend to deploy a fleet of modern Western-style tanks, which they have, including German Leopard 2s, British Challenger 2s, and the American M1 Abrams. But are foreign donations going to be able to match Russian tank production? Well, it's hard to say, but it probably wouldn't hurt for Ukraine's Western allies to throw in a few more tanks especially because the Ural Vagonzavod plant can, hypothetically, produce enough new T-90s in the next six months to match Ukraine's current inventory of comparable modern battle tanks. 
But even if this theory is true, and an increasing number of T-90s are being destroyed largely because more are being manufactured and deployed, that certainly isn't the whole story. The overall effectiveness and functionality of the T-90 has been a matter of debate since the beginning, with many distinguished experts expertly concluding that, overall, the T-90 is a piece of junk. First introduced as the T-72BU, then renamed the T-90 to distinguish it from all the other T-72 variants, the T-90 was thought to be one of the most well-protected tanks in the world, while also boasting one of the most heavily equipped battle systems currently on the market. After being officially brought into service in 1992, the T-90 has received a number of upgrades and subsequent name changes. In 2004, it was renamed the T-90A, and then in 2016, it was upgraded and rebranded again as the T-90M. Then, after its most recent upgrade in 2017, it came to be called the T-90MS. There were also less popular variants along the way, but those aren't worth mentioning here. Since its conception, one of the major selling points of the T-90 has been its relatively low cost. Save for the most recent variant, the T-90MS, which runs closer to $4 million, the full line of older, less expensive T-90 models can still be purchased and exported for around $3 million. Even though it continues to be produced primarily for use by the Russian Army's armored division, the Kremlin has sold and exported thousands of T-90s, mostly T-90S variants, to countries such as Algeria, Armenia, and Iraq. In fact, India alone is now in possession of more than 2,000 Russian-built T-90Ss. Underneath the hood, so to speak, of all currently available T-90 variants is a V-12 diesel engine. The most powerful, coming in at 1,130 horsepower, can be found on the T-90MS. The T-90 is also about 20 tons lighter than the M1 Abrams, and was designed to accommodate and be operated by, thanks to its auto-loading firing system, just a three-man crew. Upon closer inspection, however, the effectiveness of both the engine and loading system have come into question, but more on that a bit later. So what about firepower? Well, if the T-90 has one thing going for it, it definitely has a lot of that. The T-90's 2A46M4 125mm smoothbore main gun can fire a range of high-tech ammunition options, including armor-piercing, fin-stabilized discarding sabot rounds, as well as the anti-tank guided missiles mentioned earlier, also known as the 9M119 Reflex, or by NATO as the AT-11 Sniper. These high-tech projectiles have a maximum range of 4,000 meters, with a flight time of 11.7 seconds, and can, under certain conditions, even take down helicopters. Also in terms of firepower, the T-90 features two externally mounted machine guns. One is a 12.7mm cord heavy machine gun that has a cycle rate of fire of 700 to 800 rounds per minute and can be remotely operated from within the tank. The other is a PKMT 7.62mm coaxial machine gun. And when it comes to protection, in addition to conventional armor plating, modern T-90 variants also come equipped with two very high-tech defensive systems. The first is the Shatora-1, an active protection system made by the Russian company Electronic Torg that includes a 360-degree laser warning receiver complete with automatically triggered countermeasures. The deploy of the tank is painted by an enemy laser. This device can even orient the tank's main gun in the direction of the laser's origin. The Shatora-1, among other features, also comes with an infrared jammer and a grenade launching system that has the capacity to discharge smoke grenades which release an infrared obscuring aerosol cloud. The modern T-90's second line of defense is its Contact 5 Explosive Reactive Armor, or ERA, which is essentially a layer of high explosive sandwiched between two metal plates designed to minimize the damage of explosive projectiles by detonating just prior to their impact. Pretty fancy, right? ERA was specifically designed to counter a range of advanced weaponry, including missiles and rockets carrying high explosive anti-tank warheads as well as highly deadly sabot rounds, which separate after being fired and turn into a thin, fin-stabilized rod made of depleted uranium. Once a sabot round impacts an enemy tank, the kinetic force it creates while penetrating also creates a steam of molten metal that pours into the cabin with it. This instantaneously increases the temperature and pressure inside of the sealed turret, killing or rather cooking everyone inside. The T-90 also comes with a magnetic mine detection system that, when functioning properly, uses an electromagnetic pulse to disable mines before the tank can run over them. So then, what's the deal, you might be asking? 
Why aren't these extra fancy protection systems making the T90s unstoppable? For one, these systems haven't performed so well against long-range anti-tank guided missiles. There was one report that stated a Ukrainian took out two T-90Ms back-to-back -back using an AT-4 anti-tank weapon. If that report is accurate, this would be a very impressive set of skills. The Swedish-made Saab AT-4, given to the Ukrainians by the US and Sweden, is a lightweight, shoulder-launched anti-armor weapon. However, despite delivering an 84mm projectile out to a range of 300 meters, this unguided weapon should not be effective against a T-90M's reactive armor, which the manufacturers claim is effective against not just low-speed rockets and missiles, but also tank rounds coming in at hypersonic speeds. There are, it seems, even more embarrassing ways to lose a tank, which Russia has also discovered recently. Apparently, a group of Russian technicians accidentally set fire to a T-72 they were attempting to repair. In the confusion, the ammunition on board caught fire and exploded, completely destroying the tank and damaging two others nearby. The loss of this tank and the two T-90Ms suggest that a more complex set of problems might be plaguing the Russian military. And this makes the actual durability and effectiveness of the T-90 more difficult to determine. Is the hyped T-90M any less vulnerable than earlier models? It's hard to tell when it's regularly being used without proper tactical or common sense. Another reason the T-90 was poorly conceived compared to other main battle tanks is that its underlying design is outdated. Ultimately, as we mentioned before, the T-90 is simply an improved version of the T-72. Essentially, the turret of the T-80 and the hull and drivetrain of the T-72 combined together and covered over with reactive armor. And because the T-90 is in its essence only an update, it retains all of the defects of its bargain-built older brothers. Its inherent shortcomings leading to the apparent failure of the T-90's ultra-modern defensive systems is one thing, but this tank has also been the victim of tactical incompetence and has regularly been rolled into impossible no-win situations. In modern warfare, advancing tanks are supposed to be supported by infantry for the very purpose of suppressing enemy ground troops who might be using anti-tank weapons like the AT-4. Deployed armor should also have artillery support, if only to help mitigate any long-range threats. Sending tanks forward without defensive support, as Russia has continued to do in Ukraine, makes them extremely vulnerable, especially to infantry units using shoulder-launched weapons. Mobile ground units, when allowed to get in close, can carry out ambushes at short range, which allows them to focus their attacks on a tank's more vulnerable target areas. A particularly vulnerable area for these tanks that's also been exposed by the creative fighting tactics being used in Ukraine is the roof. So it seems the T-90 has had some trouble with the anti-tank missiles that are fired from elevated positions and ultimately come down onto these vehicles from above. The T-90's 360-degree active protection system is supposed to protect from this sort of attack, and its failure to do so might suggest that this fancy new system isn't as infallible as first advertised. A range of other deficiencies came to light after the first T-90 was captured, intact, from the battlefield in Ukraine. With the tank now safely in their possession, military specialists from the Ukrainian Center for the Study of Captured and Prospective Weapons and Military Equipment were able to conduct an analysis of all internal equipment and armaments and went on to publicly announce their findings in March of 2023. When, around the same time, another T-90A was captured, this one was apparently handed over to the US, also for the purpose of research. But when one of Russia's most modern pieces of armor was spotted on a trailer in Louisiana, then subsequently photographed, a debate surrounding the tank's unlikely appearance on American soil exploded on social media. It isn't fully known what the US ultimately had planned for the tank, but we do know what Ukraine did with theirs. They ripped it apart, literally and figuratively. Once the team of Ukrainian experts had completed their investigation, they claimed to have uncovered little more than an old T-72 hiding beneath the shell of widespread Russian propaganda, labeling Russia's new war machine an overall failure and not nearly the breakthrough the Kremlin had been all along claiming it to be. The team of engineers from the Center for the Study of Captured and Prospective Weapons and Military Equipment also noted that the well-praised automatic loader was largely the same design as could be found on the older T-72, the only major difference being that the ammo was now stored in a separate compartment outside the turret. This modification, however, created the complication of tankers having to fully exit the vehicle 
in order to load ammunition into the main compartment, which, to be done with any practical sense or relative amount of safety, would require that the tank leave the field of battle. Talk about taking yourself out of the fight. The center also reportedly discovered significant limitations concerning the T-90's B92S2F V12 diesel engine, which Ukrainian engineers claimed did not have sufficient power to reliably propel the vehicle, a claim that was supported by videos of T-90s getting stuck in the mud. They also noted that the highly praised Kalina computerized fire control system had incorporated in its design not only civilian electronic components, but some of Western origin. While other electronic components had been assembled without adhering to moisture control requirements, resulting in increased oxidation, shortened lifespan, and unexpected failure. But the embarrassment of Russian tank builders isn't the Kremlin's biggest problem here. If Ukraine persists in revealing the secrets and vulnerabilities of the allegedly advanced systems and technologies of the T-90, this could potentially create a serious financial challenge for Russia in the future by giving other countries the information needed to produce their own while simultaneously diminishing the hype surrounding the Russian-made T-90, sales are bound to diminish. And this is no small sum we're talking about. Russia has currently received a combined total of nearly $10 billion for exported T-90s from India and Algeria alone, but a fair amount of damage seems to have already been done. As reports of the T-90's mediocrity have continued to surface, Many foreign companies that had previously signed contracts with Russia have swiftly cancelled those agreements. All these technological and mechanical shortcomings, though, are only part of the bigger story. The lack of success the T-90 has had on the battlefield in Ukraine cannot be truly understood without looking at the opposition they faced. It would be a disservice to Ukraine's ferocious troops to do otherwise. Combined with grit and determination born largely of national pride, Ukrainian forces have also received an impressive amount of anti-tank weaponry from the US, as well as other allies. From the US alone, Ukraine has received more than 10,000 Javelin anti-armor systems, 90,000 other anti-armor systems and munitions, 8,000 tube-launched, optically-tracked, wire-guided Tau missiles, 35,000 grenade launchers and small arms, 4 million rounds of small arms ammunition and grenades, and a whole slew of laser-guided rocket systems, rocket launchers, and anti-tank mines. According to Washington's regularly updated list of wartime contributions, which includes 31 Abrams tanks, 45 T-72B tanks, 186 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, 20 Mi-17 helicopters, dozens of combat drones, lots of state-of-the-art satellite communications equipment, and more than 100,000 sets of body armor and helmets, President Biden has provided nearly $44 billion in military assistance to Ukraine thus far. Weapons are a critical part of warfare, that's obvious, but without resourcefulness, they will only take a conventional force so far, which makes the new tactic Ukrainian forces have been using against Russian tanks that much more impressive. To go along with their already proven yet more traditional ambush maneuvers, they've also developed a highly creative yet simple way of utilizing landmines. Essentially, as a Russian mine plow clears a path through a known minefield, Ukrainian troops will wait for it to pass, then toss fresh mines onto the same path right in front and sometimes behind the trailing convoy, effectively littering the cleared corridor with new mines. The vehicles following the mine plow end up hitting these mines or run over the mines as they try to escape the trap. To execute this brazen new maneuver, the Ukrainians have been utilizing two different types of mines. One is the Soviet TM-62, the other is the American Remote Anti-Armor Mine System, or RAM, of which the US has donated more than 30,000. The 21-pound TM-62 is what you think of when you think of a traditional mine, basically a big metal disc packed with explosives and fitted with some sort of fuse. The RAM, on the other hand, is slightly different and consists of nine mines that are four pounds each stacked together in a hollow 155mm artillery shell. With practice, Ukrainian troops have found that a few well-aimed volleys can scatter scores of these, each with a magnetic fuse, across a relatively wide area. This tactic has been a big success recently, as armored vehicles have continued to roll in neat lines across the fields and forests between the Russian-occupied cities of Pavlivka and Volodar. And what often happens, after the lead tank hits a mine and explodes, the rest of the column attempts to scatter. 
Some vehicles try to go around the wrecked lead vehicle, only to hit a mine themselves. In these scenarios, even retreat is dangerous, as there might be fresh mines now scattered behind the column, littered across the very path it used to come through. In the past weeks, in the region surrounding Fuladar, the Russians have lost 30 or more armored vehicles, including a few tanks, and it seems that well-placed mines have largely been the cause. To defeat these tactics and save a few of their prized T-90s, Russia will need, at minimum, better intelligence and a more flexible command and control strategy. In theory, the narrow TM-62 minefields shouldn't be that hard to avoid if the opposing force was able to, let's say, organize 24-hour surveillance and a reliable means of disseminating information to its frontline forces. And Russia will need exactly that if they want to keep ahead of Ukraine's clearly savvy military engineers. But what do you think? Have the technical shortcomings of the Russian T-90 been the primary cause of its poor performance? Or are these tanks being utilized poorly and judged unfairly? Also, how might foreign military aid and Ukraine's improvised tactics be contributing to the loss of so many Russian tanks? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Why is Putin afraid to deploy the Su-57 to Ukraine? Maybe because much like its land-based counterpart, the T-14 Armata, it's one of the most oversold and disappointing assets within the Russian military. Then there's the fact that Ukraine has been successfully shooting down so many Russian jets that Putin is terrified of his shiny new toy being captured and having its true RCS revealed by the West, as well as the release of any other advanced capabilities, or lack thereof. Let's dive in. When it comes to recent Russian military equipment, there are two things to remember. First, don't believe the hype. And second, make sure your accountant checks the numbers. One of the most overhyped and underwhelming members of the new Russian military is the Su-57 fighter, codenamed Felon by NATO. That codename may be its coolest feature. It promises a lot but delivers much less. What's even more surprising is the way that Russia has been shielding this aircraft from potential risk in the skies near Ukraine. We say near since there's no evidence yet that Russia has risked flying the aircraft anywhere but within Russian airspace, except for a very few brief appearances over much less dangerous Syrian airspace. During those brief deployments in 2018, the Su-57 was still considered a prototype and was described by aviation expert and author Tom Cooper as burdened with inadequate and incomplete sensors, incomplete fire control systems, and self-protection suites, no operational integrated avionics, and unreliable engines. Despite its clean lines, impressive maneuverability, and eye-catching paint schemes, this aircraft falls short in many vital areas, including less than stellar stealth capabilities, its use of outdated engines, a reliance on less than state-of-the-art computer systems, and extremely limited production numbers. Much like the more capable US-made F-22 Raptor and F-35 Lightning stealth fighters, the Su-57 ran into extensive development delays and cost overruns. But unlike the F-22 and F-35, the final aircraft has not lived up to pre-production hype. Actually, we can go as far as to say the Su-57 isn't even comparable to the F-22 and F-35. Here's why. The design and layout of the Sukhoi Su-57 Felon is an evolution of the previous Soviet Union's Su-27 shape, adapted for the requirements of low visibility and supersonic speed and agility. In many Western circles, the Su-57 has been described as a stealth flanker, the flanker being the NATO designation for the Su-27. Both planes are twin-engine, twin-tailed planes, with an emphasis on being multi-role aircraft, meaning they can handle both air superiority roles as well as being able to strike ground targets with onboard munitions. The Su-57 began development in the early 2000s and has been delayed several times. Its original prototype was expected to make its maiden flight back in the year 2007, but numerous problems with its design have caused equally numerous delays. While its engines are essentially the same as those of the aircraft it's designed to replace, the Su-35S, their implementation has not gone well. At first, the Russians refused to acknowledge that their new jet had a development problem. Finally, in late 2009, the Russians admitted that problems with the engine were causing the delays. The original concept for the Su-57 was for the plane to use the newly designed and more powerful Isdel I-30 engines. However, nearly all the prototypes and production models released so far are equipped with the same engine used on the existing Su-35S. 
the AL41 engine. The reason the ISDL i30 engines haven't been used yet is due to reliability and quality control issues, which have yet to be ironed out. Beyond those problems, both the AL41 and the ISDL i30 are nothing more than a slightly updated and heavier version of the AL31 engine, which was designed back in the 1970s. That the SU57, designed to be the best frontline fighter for the latter half of the 2020s, flying with what are effectively 50-year-old engine designs is just one of the plane's troubles. The other problem that carries over from the earlier AL-31 engine is its propensity for catching fire. The Russian plane that sported the majority of these engines, the MiG-31, has a history of crashes due to engine fires, and the AL-41 used in the Su-57 seems to have inherited that engine fire gene. The very first serial production example, Su-57, crashed in 2019, due to what Russian state-run media outlet RIA Novosti said was a mishap occurred during an engine test, or a potential failure in the Su-57's engine control system, but Russian news agency TASS reported that it was a flight control system error. This possible engine fire followed one of the Type's T-50 prototypes that was badly damaged due to an engine fire in 2014. These engine problems, along with unanticipated structural fatigue in the fuselage and wings, caused a redesign that included more carbon fiber material, a reinforced airframe, and an enhanced wingspan. These additions raised the overall weight of the Su-57 to more than 25 tons, which further reduced its performance on its older engine models, and led to additional crashes during testing. These changes and additions delayed the expected first delivery model from 2015 all the way to 2020. The Su-57 was expected to be Russia's entry into what's known as a fifth-generation fighter. These types of planes, including the earlier US-made F-117, more of a stealth testbed than an actual fifth-gen fighter, and the much more advanced F-22 Raptor, introduced several new concepts into the aviation industry. These new benchmarks included advanced stealth, or in the case of the Su-57, stealthier, airframes with reduced radar cross-section RCS, Active Electronically Scanned Array AESA, radar, a type of phased array antenna, and supercruise capabilities, which means a fighter can fly above Mach 1 without using afterburners. In comparison, the US-made F-22 is able to cruise at speeds of Mach 1.5 or greater without the use of afterburners for extended periods in combat configuration. The Su-57 does hit most of the 5th gen benchmarks reasonably well. However, it's in the realm of stealth capability that the Su-57 has been heavily criticized. It certainly falls far short of its US counterparts when compared against the F-22 and F-35. Russian aviation expert Pyotr Batowski points out in his book Russia's Warplanes Volume 1 that the primary means of reducing radar visibility is to carry normally wing or belly-mounted munitions in the interior of the plane. External weapons and extra fuel tanks, along with the racks with which they are attached to the plane, dramatically increase the radar cross-section of a plane. Mounting those internally removes those obstructions, but the improvement comes at a cost. For one, it means the plane can carry fewer of these add-ons, while it also means the airframe must be bigger and wider, which leads to an increased weight, which requires a more powerful engine, or in the Su-57's case, dual engines. That double-engine design also means the plane is more susceptible to infrared heat-seeking missiles. It also means the external exhaust nozzles increase the radar cross-section on their own. That problem can be countered by embedding the exhaust within the body of the airframe, which both the F-22 and F-35 do remarkably well, but the Su-57 doesn't even try to hide its dual exhausts, making it more observable to enemy detection. There's also the need to deal with the straight lines for the engine intakes, as well as the turbine blades just inside those air ducts. Again, the F-22 and F-35 have been designed not just with embedded fan blades, making them almost undetectable by enemy radar, but the intakes are also covered in radar-absorbent material. The Su-57 employs radar blockers to reduce reflections from the engine inlet guide vanes and are installed in the engine air intake ducts, but they don't do enough to remove that radar return. The shape of the airframe has been designed to reduce the number of directions in which electromagnetic waves are reflected, including blending the wings into the airframe's body, which helps increase the plane's stealthiness. But there are other problems with the plane that add to its lack of stealthiness. One glaring problem is that the entire plane isn't coated in radar-absorbent materials, which the F-22 and F-35 have. 
The Su-57 does have a paint job that many warplane simulation enthusiasts think is really awesome and super cool looking, but it does nothing to hide the plane from enemy radar. What's even worse is that the Su-57 has exposed rivets all across the plane, especially on its wings. Those dramatically increase the plane's radar signature, making the plane stand out in real combat. The Russian-leaning website MilitaryWatchMagazine.com, always quick to criticize Western military technology while simultaneously lauding Russian ones, claims the Su-57 is built with a unique blend of low-reflectivity fiberglass, which was offered as a beneficial alternative to the more radar-absorbent stealth coatings used on US and Chinese stealth aircraft, due to its much lower maintenance needs. But the number of problems with this type of an airframe, as seen in the efforts to strengthen and improve the plane after it was supposed to be ready for combat trials, shows that this method of construction presents its own inherent weaknesses. The plane's manufacturer Sukhoi claims the Su-57 has an optimal radar cross-section between 0.1 to 1 square meters. For comparison, the F-117 had a radar cross-section of around 0.003, about one-third as much as an ordinary bird while the F-35 has an RCS of 0.005 and the F-22 has an RCS of 0.001, which is somewhere around 1,000 to 10,000 times smaller than the Su-57's RCS. In comparison, a B-52 bomber has a radar cross-section rating of 100, an Su-27 has a rating of 15, an F-16, flying clean, meaning without external weapons and fuel tanks, has a 5, a MiG-21 has a 3, an F-16C has a 1.2, an F-A-18 has a 1.0, and the SR-71 Blackbird has a 0.01, which is about the same as an average bird. The F-35's radar cross-section has been compared to a hummingbird, while the F-22's cross-section has been compared to that of a bumblebee. To understand the real-world difference, Russia's standard surface-to-air system, the S-400, uses a 91N6E search radar, which has a detection range of about 240 miles against a target of 4 square meters. If it's operating under optimal conditions, it should be able to detect an F-15 at 325 miles, an F-A-18E Super Hornet around 1 square meter RCS, at 170 miles, the Su-57 assuming 0.1 square meter RCS at 96 miles, and an F-22 or an F-35 with an RCS of 0.005 or less at only around 17 miles. In short, a radar would have between 6 to 10 times greater detection range against the Su-57 compared to an F-22 or an F-35. Russia's problem is that many Western analysts don't believe that the 0.1 RCS that the plane's manufacturer Shukhoi claims to have is accurate. If it's found to be closer to 1 or even higher, then its capabilities as a stealth fighter dramatically decrease, which means bad things for Russia's ability to sell the plane overseas to its usual markets like India and China. All of this leads to the question, if the Russians are so positive the Su-57 is the equal of the F-22 and is the best aircraft Russia has ever built, why are they so reluctant to use it in the current invasion of Ukraine? It's been a glaring issue for the Russian military that they haven't yet established air control over the Ukrainian battlefield, something that their much larger air force was intent on demonstrating from the earliest days of the fighting. The answer is a simple one, though with complicated ramifications. Russia doesn't want to fly one of its very limited number of state-of-the-art aircraft for fear of having it shot down. The risk of having the Su-57 captured and thereby having its true RCS revealed by the West, as well as the release of any other advanced capabilities or lack thereof, is one reason why Russia has been so reluctant to deploy the plane over Ukrainian territory. For a country that has a much smaller and more outdated air force, Ukraine has done a remarkable job of shooting down Russian aircraft and helicopters. As of March 2023, Ukraine had shot down 70 Russian fighter aircraft, at the loss of only 60 of their own. And that's not including one disastrous day for Russia, when on May 15, 2023, they lost two fighter jets, an Su-34 and an Su-35, plus two Mi-8 helicopters, all within 12 hours, and all within the Russian territory of Bryansk. The fact that Russia lost multiple downed aircraft within Russian territory all at the same time was a stunning blow to their air force. Some Western analysts believe Ukrainian air defense systems might have been pushed closer to the border with Russia to engage aircraft that direct their attacks from within Russian borders. The Russian Air Force has recently begun using more glide munitions, which are bombs with pop-out fins that can strike targets at a greater distance. 
Ukrainian Air Force spokesman Yuri Enat explained after the May 15th incidents that Russian airplanes regularly attack Ukraine from Russian territory. He said their strike air group attacked Ukraine from the north from Bryansk Oblast. They do this almost every day. They carry out strikes with guided bombs. Another black day for Russian military aviation was June 24, 2023, the day of the abortive rebellion by Yevgeny Prigozhin's Wagner mercenary group. In less than 24 hours, Prigozhin's men managed to shoot down seven combat helicopters, as well as one of Russia's most valuable air assets, an IL-22M airborne command post. It is believed that all of the pilots and personnel on board the eight aircraft were lost. The fact that all of these planes were within Russian airspace shows just how dangerous the invasion against Ukraine has been for the Russian Air Force. The open-source combat tracker Oryx says that the Russian aircraft losses are even higher, confirming that they've lost, at a minimum, 77 fixed-wing aircraft as of July 14, 2023, with another 90 helicopters lost. Oryx's numbers are based only on confirmed losses, so the total number of Russian airplanes lost is almost certainly even higher. Another of the major problems with the Su-57 is that there just aren't very many of them available for the Russian Air Force. The West's best estimates are that Russia has only received somewhere between 5 and 15 of the aircraft, with most analysts suggesting Russia is currently flying a total of only 12 felons. Even TASS, the Russian news agency, says a best-case scenario would see Russia possibly receiving as many as 76 Su-57s, but only by the end of 2028. And that's assuming a big ramp-up of production that Russia's economy doesn't appear likely to meet. These numbers pale in comparison to the number of F-22 Raptors that the US currently has flying, which includes 142 combat aircraft and another 44 used for training and testing new equipment and upgrades. Even more impressive is the number of F-35 Lightnings currently flying. The US alone is operating more than 450 F-35s in its three configurations, the original A version, the vertical short takeoff and landing, VSTOL B version, and the carrier C version. But the F-35's true advantage is the ability to sell these aircraft to America's allies. When you include those countries, there are currently more than 850 F-35s in service around the world, and the US is producing another 156 more of these planes every year. One of the problems that Russia has had in producing the Su-57 has been a lack of overseas partners. One of its original allies in this program was going to be India, who had agreed with Russia back in 2016 to create an improved Su-57 that would have been called the Fifth Generation Fighter Aircraft Program, or FGFA. But years of delays and concerns that the FGFA would not meet project goals led India to put the program on indefinite hold in 2018. India complained that the base Su-57 was too expensive, poorly engineered, and powered by old and unreliable engines. The degree with which India was unhappy with the Su-57 is borne out by the fact that India willingly walked away from the project after already dropping $295 million into pre-development costs, money they'll never get back. With India's departure from the program, Russia lost the largest potential buyer of any future Su-57 aircraft, which meant that Russia will have to bear the cost of developing and producing the aircraft alone. Another potential buyer, Algeria, has a contract to acquire Su-57s in 2025, but that deal may also fall through because Russian firms will not risk having them flight-tested on site in Algeria. And Algeria doesn't trust Russia, to be honest, about any tests done in Russian airspace. Instead of working with Russia for its next aircraft, India has announced an agreement to buy the fourth-gen Rafale fighter from France and has placed an order for 26 of the aircraft, as well as three Scorpene-class submarines. These purchases show how far India has gone to diversify its armaments purchases, while also distancing itself from Russian arms manufacturers. China has already said no to the Su-57, as it's developing its own fifth-gen stealth fighter, the J-20 Super Dragon, which itself will eventually be replaced by an even better model, their as-yet unnamed sixth-gen advanced stealth fighter, which is still under development and not expected to see full production until sometime after 2026. Then there's Russia's failed export sale of existing Su-35 planes to Iran. They had a deal in place for Iran to purchase up to 50 already built Su-35s, an agreement concluded in 2014 during the second term of President Hassan Rouhani. According to a former Iranian diplomat, at the time of purchase, Russia had promised to deliver the Su-35s in 2023, but neither Iran nor Russia is expecting the planes to be delivered this year. 
Whether the unexpected loss of so many aircraft in the Ukraine invasion is to be blamed for this delay, or as some have speculated, Israel was able to dissuade Russia from sending Iran the planes, is still a matter of speculation. Either way, not sending aircraft that have already been paid for sends a strongly negative signal to any other potential buyers of Russian armaments. Which leads us to our next question, posed by many Western commentators. Is the Su-57 actually the worst stealth fighter in any modern air force? When taking into account its comparatively poor RCS, its unreliable engines, its pitifully small production numbers, and its reliance on fiberglass framing instead of stealth coating, it seems that it's not really even comparable to the current best stealth aircraft, the F-22 and the F-35, and might even be considered less satisfactory than the Chinese J-20, which seems to many analysts to be a pirated copy of the F-22 Raptor, built with stolen technology. Henry Kelsall, military analyst and aviation expert, says, Russia's Su-57 Felon is a troubled aircraft and a poor stealth fighter, with an abnormally high radar cross-section and just 10 in active service. He adds, it's an aircraft that should have stealth capabilities, but the Su-57 falls remarkably short in this area. Aircraft such as the F-22 Raptor and F-35 Lightning II have it beaten in this department. As such, it's arguable that the Su-57 is the world's worst stealth aircraft currently in service. Russian President Vladimir Putin, on the other hand, seems to be willing to claim it's not only not that bad, but that the Felon is the best stealth fighter in the world. This is the world's best plane by all its operational characteristics and its armament, Putin said about the Su-57, according to a report broadcast by Russian news agency TASS. No other aircraft in the world can fly as well as our plane. This is the true reason why Russia can't afford to have one of their few Su-57s shot down. If the West were to get their hands on a shot-down felon and discover, as many analysts have pointed out, that this plane is nothing more than a souped-up fourth-gen fighter, then its chances of ever being sold to overseas buyers would vanish in a heartbeat. The aviation writer, ex-Marine and foreign policy and defense technology analyst Alex Hollings says, The Su-57 isn't quite as advanced, quite as capable, or quite as stealthy as the other three fighters of its generation. As far as their effectiveness in the Ukraine invasion, he added, to date, there are so few Su-57s in existence that any capability they offer the Russian military is superficial at best. Russia will likely keep the Felon within its own territory and will only operate it when the plane is out of Ukrainian surface-to-air missile range, which is from 60 to 90 miles. A shootdown of the vaunted Su-57 would be a terrible blow to Russia and a public relations bonanza for the Ukrainians and its allies in the West. So whether its stealthiness is as bad as its many detractors suggest, the Su-57 Felon is one plane that Ukraine will probably never see flying through the skies. But what do you think? Will Putin ever send the Su-57 into battle? If so, do you think it will live up to the hype he's generated around it? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. In Russia, in the spring of 2015, flatbed train wagons were spotted carrying unfamiliar armored vehicles. The turrets were carefully wrapped in a tarpaulin, clearly intended to prevent a casual observer from gaining much information about the vehicles. On the 9th of May 2015, at Russia's annual Victory Day Parade, celebrating the defeat of Nazi Germany in May 1945, the tarpaulin came off, and a handful of these vehicles made their first public appearance. It was a brand new tank system, designated the T-14 Armata, or Weapon, main battle tank. It was not an impressive debut. One of the tanks broke down on the parade route and was stranded for 15 minutes until hasty repairs could be made, and it was again able to move off under its own power. But the appearance of the tank caused suppressed ripples of excitement and concern in equal measures amongst Western intelligence communities. What details could be seen suggested a revolutionary new design. The tank commander, braced smartly as he delivered a crisp salute to the watching Russian dignitaries, was not in the turret but rather in the forward part of the hull. The turret appeared to be uncrewed. The Russian government announced that trials would soon start and then production would begin. There was talk of producing 120 per year and that an ultimate production line of 2,300 tanks would replace and upgrade the entire active Russian tank fleet. A quote family of Armata vehicles was to include an infantry fighting vehicle and armored recovery vehicle and a self-propelled artillery version. This would be a very big deal. But the best part of a decade later, and the T-14 still does not appear to have been produced in any significant numbers. It has not seen any active service and, indeed, 
Its entire future is shrouded in mystery. After the initial fanfare and attention, the T-14s become something of a laughing stock amongst military analysts. In late 2023, many analysts were convinced that the T-14 will never work as a fully produced operational combat vehicle. So what is the T-14? What happened to it and where is it now? And is it any good? Let's take a look at the T-14 Armata. Russian tank design achieved legendary status during the Second World War. You will almost certainly have heard of the T-34, which is still judged to be one of the best tanks of World War II. Its sloped armor, wide tracks, and powerful for the time 76mm gun came as a great shock to the German panzer formations that thrust into Russia during the Operation Barbarossa in June 1941. Other Russian tank designs such as the KV-1, the T-34-85, and the Joseph Stalin sent the Germans scrambling for their tank design drawing boards. During the Cold War, Russian tanks continued to evolve. The T-54-55 series, the T-64 and 72 models, and later the T-80 and T-90. Russian policy was to keep the tanks low to the ground, hard-hitting with a powerful main armament, and available in large numbers. They were rarely as technologically advanced as NATO tanks, but they were largely respected by NATO and Western armies, particularly given the well-understood principle that these tanks would generally be used in massed formations. But it's worth noting that, scratching the surface, the Russian tank industry has always been fractured by rivalries between tank factories, competing designers, corruption, and struggles for attention and resources of the government. Some analysts have looked at the T-64, T-72, and T-80 and concluded that this was an illogical and highly uneconomic production of three versions of what was more or less the same tank. What seems clear is that the Russian military never seems to have managed to settle on one tank type and one family of vehicles. It also looked as if the Russian tank industry was still living off its old glory days without the resources to invest in a new tank suitable for the 2020s and beyond. Perhaps because of these deep-seated historical challenges, Russian tank design has preferred to focus on upgrading existing tank models with new technology, armor, and protective systems, rather than develop a new tank. And the Russians never like to throw any old tanks away. They store them in huge tank parks east of the Ural Mountains for a time when they might be needed. A time such as now. You'll see more or less every Cold War and post-Cold War variety of Russian tank on the battlefields of Ukraine. When a prototype tank design, the T-95, was cancelled in 2010, the Russian tank producing industrial complex of Ural Vagonzavod began working on a new model. It was initially called Object 148. This was to become the T-14 Armada, but it doesn't seem to have been actually based on the previous T-95 work, but rather around a new engine type, the A-85-3, a Russian copy of a German model. This engine was used instead of the classic tank engine that had kitted out the T-72s and T-90s. The reason for that is unclear. The A-85-3 was smaller but more powerful, but it also turned out to be more complex and less reliable and it had not even been originally designed for a tank. After the T-14's somewhat embarrassing debut at the 2015 Victory Day Parade, the Western intelligence community started to put their heads together to see what this new development was all about. The information that began to trickle in was, from a Western perspective, very troubling. Given that there is little confirmed or confirmable information about the T-14, we'll have to rely a little heavily on the Russian defense industry brochures and state press statements. This is obviously not ideal, given the high likelihood of propaganda, but let's dive in anyway, so at least we can get a sense of the sort of expectations, hype, and anticipation surrounding this new weapon system. The concept certainly looked highly unique. The turret was to be automated and remote controlled. The three-man crew would sit side by side in a special protected and sealed crew compartment in the front hull of the vehicle. There would even be a toilet provided for the crew, a radical concession to comfort from the tank designers. The tank's main armament was originally intended to have been a 152mm weapon. This was what the earlier T-95 concept was supposed to have mounted, but it was later identified as a 125mm gun that would also be able to fire anti-tank missiles. It would have a 57mm grenade launcher and a 12.7mm heavy machine gun automatically operated in the unmanned turret. Average speed on the road was given as 80 km per hour. The seven road wheels either side were connected to an active suspension system that would give a smoother ride and provide more effective fire control while on the move. 
there was talk that the main gun would be able to shoot down low-flying helicopters. A system of video cameras would be fitted on all sides, and the commander's vision system would be mounted on the turret to allow 360-degree visibility. The crew were supported by a highly responsive combat management computer system that could rapidly analyze the battlefield environment, identify potential threats and targets, and automatically take measures to protect the tank via an Afghanit Active Protection System, or APS. They should be able to detect tank-sized objects at over 7 kilometers in the daytime and half that distance at night. A radar would identify incoming missiles. A new generation of highly secretive Malakit explosive reactive armor had also been promised. This would surround the tank with advanced protective layers of composite armor that exploded when struck, deflecting any oncoming missile. The APS deployed hard-kill defensive measures, such as systems that could attack incoming missiles and even actual tank rounds and soft-kill processes that could disrupt, confuse, and deflect any incoming attack. Some analysts concluded that the Russian designers had based the tank's defensive measures on the highly effective modern Israeli tank, the Merkava. The manufacturer claimed that special radar-absorbing paint would render the T-14 more or less invisible. A T-15 infantry fighting vehicle variant was also spotted at the Victory Day Parade, and a photograph of a T-16 tank recovery version Equipped with a bulldozer blade and an automated 12.7mm machine gun turret was issued by the manufacturers. Both variants seem to have the same armor defensive measures as the T-14. Western intelligence analysts were quick to express concern about the potential of this new vehicle system. The unmanned turret design would afford the vehicle a lighter, faster, lower profile. A leaked United Kingdom Ministry of Defense document showed very real worry about the capabilities of the T-14. In November 2016, the British Daily Telegraph newspaper carried some dramatic quotes from the assessment, calling it a groundbreaking tank and the most revolutionary step change in tank design in the last half century. A stark question was posed, are we on the cusp of a new technological arms race? There was also grave concern that the West was not also developing any plans for a tank to rival the T-14. At the time, the British and Americans were focused on the challenges of counterinsurgency warfare in the mountains, waterways, and deserts of Afghanistan. The defense industry design and development effort was being directed toward high-mobility vehicles and the challenges of defeating improvised explosive devices. For the last 20 years, Britain had no significant need for a new fleet of main battle tanks. The 2016 Military Balance Report from the International Institute for Strategic Studies similarly described the T-14 as, quote, revolutionary highlighting the tank's active protection systems as something that would greatly reduce the risk from rocket-propelled grenades and anti-tank guided missiles. After the initial announcements and revelations of the new T-14 concept, there was an analytical backlash. In the absence of any verifiable evidence, Western analysts gradually adopted a more skeptical view of the T-14. U.S. analysis in 2015 was already pointing out that there had been no independent verification or public demonstrations of the claims and capabilities attributed to the T-14, particularly how effective the defense systems would be. The American National Interest Journal, in late 2016, observed that U.S. analysts felt that the capability claims of the T-14 were greatly exaggerated. The practicalities of producing a new high-tech tank were pointed out, starting with the fact that Russia simply did not have the money and resources to produce the tank in any significant numbers. Well, the claims for the T-14 were certainly impressive. However, a famous British football manager once dryly observed, We had a great team on paper. Unfortunately, the match was played on grass. So now, having heard the hype, let's step back a bit and review some of the practical problems that the T-14 might have, as its manufacturers attempt to move it from a theoretical drawing concept to an actual working battlefield-dominating weapon. The production schedule and cryptic messages from the Russian government and industry pointed to some of these problems. The Russian Ministry of Defense declared in 2016 that a batch of 100 T-14 tanks would be manufactured by 2020 as part of a project that would go on until 2025. But this served to set the scene for confused announcements, contradictions, and delays to this original timeframe. In 2018, the Deputy Prime Minister for the Defense and Space Industry reportedly said that there was actually no need for a new main battle tank system, as the Russian army had more than enough of the older tanks, the various modified variants of the T-72 in particular, to suffice. This argument held that the existing vehicles were still effective as tank platforms 
and they would be cheaper and more practical to simply continue on with them, upgrading them with offensive and defensive measures as appropriate. This was probably a better and more realistic reflection of the harsh realities facing the Russian arms industry, but it also gave some indication of the doubts already surrounding the long-term prospects for the T-14. Finances were strained and access to high-tech computer technology was hard, given the sanctions imposed on Russia after the invasion of Ukraine in 2014. But it went in the direct contradiction of the defense industry and other parts of the government. The month after this statement came out, it was reported that a contract had been signed for 32 T-14 tanks and 100 T-15 infantry fighting vehicles. By early February 2019, the first dozen tanks were supposed to have been built, but nothing had happened and a subsequent announcement in August said that 16 would not be delivered until the end of the year. In November, the deadline had slipped further into early 2020. When 2020 rolled around, there was absolutely no evidence that anything like 100 tanks had been produced, even though there was still talk of state trials taking place and even bolder talk about unmanned versions of the T-14. But in January, the head of Rostec, Russia's largest state-owned arms company, stated that no T-14s had yet been produced and that the engine design had not yet been finalized. In August 2020, it was announced that production had started and that the tank would be given to the armed forces in 2021. But as the years drifted by, these announcements were looking less and less convincing. Another statement in July 2021 said that production would begin in 2022. However, the Russian defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, had already slightly undermined this in March, when he said the first group to be produced would only be for experimental purposes. The gap between reality and actuality continued to stretch, with announcements in December 2021 that the ammunition loader for the main armament was being trialed in 2022, and that full serial production would take place, and that 40 T-14s would be delivered after 2023. In the summer of 2022, the Russian army was several months into its invasion of Ukraine. The invasion was not going well. The war in Ukraine exposed many vulnerabilities of the Russian tank fleet. YouTube was awash with dozens of spectacular examples of tanks erupting in brilliant orange balls of flame with the turrets hurtling skyward. This showed, amongst other things, that the automatic loading concept for the main armament were flawed. Shells were not being adequately protected inside the turret with disastrous consequences. The tank designers scrambled to identify what lessons the current conflict might reveal for the T-14. The defensive measures attributed to the T-14 seem designed to protect all sides, but not from above, which is becoming a favorite angle of attack for drones. Based on early experiences of Russian armor in Ukraine, ideas for modifications for the T-14 were drafted to extend the range of the active protection system, to offer more protection against rocket-propelled grenades and anti-tank guided missiles, and to add better defense against electromagnetic and microwave weapons. In addition, it became clear that minefields were still popular with both sides, requiring new ways of remotely dealing with this threat. This would point to more delays to production. A weapon system that can prove itself effective and reliable on the battlefield can make it a highly attractive sales option for other countries. The Russians have claimed that both the Indians and the Chinese had expressed interest, and perhaps Egypt and Belarus. But it's one thing to be interested, quite another to step up with a multi-million ruble contract. Norinco, China's state-owned defense corporation, has claimed that their own tank, the VT-4, is superior to the T-14. So, here's the big question. Given that the T-14 has been evident at victory parades since 2015, is there any evidence that it's been tested in combat operations? Nearly a decade on. Well, as of today, there's no credible evidence that the T-14 has any real combat experience to point to. Curiously, in 2020, Russian government sources floated the idea that the T-14 had been tested in Syria. This seems highly unlikely even if we remembered that, quote, tested, doesn't necessarily mean, quote, combat tested. But the big question mark now is whether the T-14 has seen any service in Ukraine. For propaganda purposes and perhaps even more importantly, achieving the full overseas sales potential, it would be ideal for the Russian army to be able to point to T-14 tanks advancing across the Ukraine steppe, engaging in defeating the Western tanks, such as the German Leopard 2 and the American Abrams, with which the Ukrainian army is being equipped. A photograph of a T-14 posing next to the shattered hull of a decadent Western main battle tank would be the icing on the cake for President Putin. But so far, we've seen very little credible evidence of any T-14s in Ukraine in a serious combat role. 
Is it reasonable to expect that social media networks, open source intelligence, and drones would surely have picked up pictures of the T-14 in action by now? The Ukrainians would have reported engaging something as distinctive and interesting as a T-14. Surely. In December 2022, Russian television showed clips of the T-14 undergoing what was described as combat training and with the commentary that the tank had already been deployed to the combat zone. The size and nature of the combat zone was never clear, nor even if the tank was actually in Ukraine at all. The state-owned Russian press agency Novosti reported in late April 2023 that the T-14 had been used in an indirect fire role against Ukrainian positions. This implies the tank had been lined up behind a hill, forest, or built-up area, out of sight of the enemy and used as a form of artillery. This is not exactly the type of tactic envisaged for a frontline main battle tank. If this reporting is accurate, it suggests the Russians feel their T-14 is not yet ready for a full test in combat, or they're worried it might break down and get captured, or they're simply trying to score a propaganda victory, or all of the above. On the 9th of May 2023, no T-14 tanks appeared at the World War II Victory Parade. In July 2023, the Russian state-owned news agency TASS briefly noted that the T-14 was being used by Russian forces in southern Ukraine to test and assess the tank's performance. In any case, by the end of August 2023, the Ukrainians had never reported meeting it in battle, and on September 4th, the Russian press reported that the T-14 had been withdrawn from Ukraine. Perhaps the manufacturers simply wanted an as-used-in-Ukraine tag and a photo opportunity for the marketing brochure. But interestingly, the report also stated that additional side armor protection had been added to the tank to guard against anti-tank strikes. Clearly, the conflict in Ukraine has been throwing up fundamental development challenges, not least from drones, anti-tank missiles, and long-range artillery for all tanks in armored warfare. And let's just pause a moment. There are many other factors that impact a tank's effectiveness on the battlefield beyond merely the size of the gun and the thickness of the armor. Morale, motivation, and training are crucial. Tactical doctrine decides how best a tank should be used. Cooperation with artillery, infantry, and air power is also vital. Having a three-man crew does offer much spare capacity for routine maintenance, cooking food, mounting sentry duty, and a host of other routine but tiring tasks in a combat zone. The Russian logistics system is in tatters reliant on men to lug ammunition around, rather than automated loading systems with pallets and machines to take the strain. You could have the best tank in the world on paper, but still see it abandoned because the crew is unwilling to move into the assault, or the tank has shed a track, or because they simply have run out of fuel. But still, the myths and hype persisted. In some elements of the Russian media, there was still seemingly misplaced confidence that the T-14 would be a world-beater. An August 2022 article breathlessly reported that by 2030, the T-14 would be so advanced that the crew would be operating their own reconnaissance drones, deploy a 152mm gun, a caliber which, let's not forget, is normally the stuff of heavy artillery, fire thermobaric fuel air explosives and supersonic rounds, shoot fire and forget missiles, and be able to identify enemy targets at ranges of over 6 kilometers. When large-scale Russian land, sea, and air forces plunged into Ukraine in 2022, suddenly the world was witnessing a large-scale conflict that involved major tank actions. The Russian army suffered and continues to suffer extremely high losses to its tank, artillery, airborne, and infantry forces. Numbers of casualties of men and equipment losses remain hard to pin down, but there is a lot of credible reporting to suggest that Russia has lost a quarter of a million men and between 3 to 5,000 armored vehicles. Many analysts were shocked by the scale of Russia tank losses and the ease with which they catastrophically exploded when struck. Some analysts went as far as to predict that the tank was now an obsolete weapon of war and that drones and missiles would now rule the battlefield. This analysis is probably premature, but the rapid evolution of anti-tank technology in Ukraine is causing much pause for thought in terms of tank design. It's likely that Russian tank designers, just like their Western counterparts, will be taking a wholesale, head-scratching review of just what it means to be a tank on the battlefields of the 2030s and 2040s. But Russia, still embedded deep in this brutal conflict inside Ukraine, desperately needs tanks now, and not 10 years in the future. They've reportedly lost between 1,500 and 2,000 tanks in battle. They have no significant manufacturing capability to crank out the current tank types let alone build, test, and mass-produce serious numbers of a brand new, unproven, and technologically complex piece of equipment. 
Each of the T-14 tanks to date have been lovingly handmade. There's no factory production line standing by ready to roll out fresh new modern armor in the way that the Stalingrad tank works in 1942 were able to churn out T-34 tanks and drive them directly to the front line. And sanctions are greatly impeding the ability of defense manufacturers to access the high-quality complex electronics that are primarily available in the West. In one crazy example from October 2022, the Swedish press began reporting the mysterious disappearance of traffic speed cameras all over the country. Crucial parts of the cameras were then smuggled into Russia, where the electronic parts could be cannibalized for Russian drones. We shouldn't write off the T-14 entirely just yet. The apparent failure – failure is probably the best word here – of the T-14 development and procurement process could be used as a lesson for the Russian designers. Perhaps the T-14 or aspects of its design might end up as a technology demonstrator for new ideas further downstream, but the current realities make it highly unlikely that the Russian tank industry, suffering from corruption, lack of resources and limited finances, will be able to conceive, design and mass produce a new tank system anytime soon. They'll probably have to stick with updates to older models, the T-72 and T-90 types. The T-90M is probably the most modern Russian tank on the battlefield at present. These upgrades are expensive and difficult enough, and the rapidly changing battlefield environment will make this even more complicated. And who knows, perhaps in 10 years or so, in 2034, a new Russian tank system successor to the T-14 will find itself acquiring the legendary designator of T-34. While it's certainly possible, but think of it this way, with all the long-term flaws in the Russian government and procurement system, corruption, lack of funds, lack of assembly lines, technology sanctions, and so on, perhaps this new T-34 might turn out to be a real turkey. Oh, but you're welcome to buy the T-14 yourself at 1 35th scale, paints and brushes included. At least the plastic production lines seem to be working. But what do you think? In what way is the T-14 radical or ridiculous? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Imagine that it's the year 2030. NATO forces operating somewhere near the Baltic coastline have come across a truly frightening sight. The Russian forces on the opposite end of no man's land are outfitted in body armor, which makes them look like a unit of robocops. Their faces are covered with an intimidating helmet and visor that gives them an edge in the information domain. Their chests and all of their extremities are protected by overlapping bullet-resistant plates. To make matters worse, their armor also has an integrated exoskeleton that increases their strength, speed, and endurance. The protective power of their armor is also unparalleled. Even 50 caliber Browning machine gun rounds don't have enough stopping power to put these guys down. What's a NATO unit to do in the face of such fearsome enemies? Well, not much, because this scenario is likely to be as imaginary as anything that Hollywood can produce. Meet the Sotnik, Russia's next-generation body armor that worried defense officials and military experts when it was unveiled. If it works as advertised, there is reason indeed to be worried, but it probably won't. And there is a long history of Russian body armor failures to believe that it won't. Before Russia invaded Ukraine, defense and foreign policy analysts regarded its military as the second most capable fighting force in the world. It had demonstrated its post-Soviet prowess with experience in Chechnya in the 1990s and 2000s, Georgia in 2008, and Ukraine in 2014, when it rapidly secured control of Crimea. It was also a fearsome military. Experts remembered the devastation the Russian Air Force and artillery units had brought to the Chechen city of Grozny during multiple battles in the 1990s. Aside from the Kremlin building a formidable artillery-based land force that would be resilient against air attacks, experts also touted Russia's new, technologically advanced weapon systems. These platforms included the new fifth-generation Su-57 fighter jet and the T-14 Armata main battle tank, which was supposedly more advanced than any other tank in foreign arsenals. However, when Russia launched the invasion, these theories quickly got tossed to the winds. The supposedly fearsome Russian war machine proved hard-pressed to supply itself over even short distances. The T-14 and Su-57 were almost nowhere to be seen, and Russian soldiers found themselves bogged down in a costly war of attrition, suffering from poor command doctrine and Western weapons like the Javelin and HIMARS, which proved so devastating to their supposedly latest and greatest gear. Even the venerable Patriot air defense system, 
which first came online in the 1980s, was able to knock one of Russia's ultra-modern Kinzhal hypersonic missiles, which Vladimir Putin had once touted as invincible, out of the sky. Now the Russian military is boasting about its next-generation body armor, the Sotnik. If it delivers as promised, it will protect its wearer better than any other body armor system in the world, but like most Russian boasting, there's a lot of hype about the Sotnik and not a whole lot of facts. Since 2016, Russian troops have worn the Ratnik 2 body armor system, accompanied by the 6B45 helmet. The Ratnik's vest has an effective area protection that is larger than most other body comparable armor systems. Based on a material similar to Kevlar, the Ratnik covers 90% of a soldier's body, and its granite ceramic plates can withstand 10 sniper rifle shots from a distance of only 10 meters. It is a good system to protect against shrapnel and explosive fragments too. The Ratnik's overalls protect the entire body from these flying pieces of metal and other debris. Ratnik 2 takes care to protect the groin and extremities like the hands. The 6B45 helmet, meanwhile, covers an area of 30 square decimeters with effective protection. Despite this, the helmet remains light at only 1 kilogram, which means that Russian military personnel can attach various instruments to it without adding undue strain on their necks. Such equipment includes thermal and night vision monoculars, flashlights, and a communication system with specialized headphones. Perhaps most impressively, the Ratnik 2 body armor has an electromagnetic camouflage system that shields its wearer from infrared sensors. The armor weighs between 40 and 50 pounds, but some of the weight is relieved by a passive carbon fiber exoskeleton. The exoskeleton also protects its wearer's spine and joints from the gradual wear and tear that lugging around such heavy weight will do to a person over time. This exoskeleton does not need an external power source to function. Ratnik is supposed to be getting an upgrade too. In 2020, Russia announced it would be developing its Ratnik 3 body armor system. This version would include an integrated exoskeleton, a helmet visor-mounted target designation system, stealth fabric, anti-mine boots, a vision system via electric goggles that would allow soldiers to link up with the camera views of small drones and see tactical orders or maps of the broader area, and an anti-thermal and anti-radar camouflage suit. The integrated exoskeleton for the Ratnik 3 was getting an upgrade as well. It was reportedly designed to comfortably haul weights of up to 132 pounds during combat operations. In 2021, American military planners were nervous about these developments. There was the feeling that the United States was lagging behind on body armor and exoskeleton systems for its soldiers and Marines. The revelation of Sotnik made American defense officials and think tanks even more nervous. Now they know better. Unfortunately for Russia, much of the hype about the Ratnik was a bunch of boasts, as we've come to expect by now. In 2017, the Russian army said it had received 200,000 sets of Ratnik 2 body armor. The following year, the Russian Ministry of Defense said it expected that all of its military personnel would be equipped with the Ratnik 2 by 2020. But 2020 came and went, and the Russian military failed in its goal. The invasion of Ukraine proved as such. Instead of getting standard-issue gear, Russian troops fighting in Ukraine, even those in the regular army at the start of the invasion, have had to make do with what body armor they could get. Most of the Ratnik's claims failed to materialize on the battlefield. Complaints about body armor and helmet malfunction have been frequent in the Russian ranks throughout the course of the war. Instead of the new Ratnik, some of the luckier Russian troops have been seen wearing older 6B23 body armor in Ukraine. This armor can be protective against indirect impacts like shrapnel or shell fragments, but lacks the ability to adequately defend its wearer from direct ballistic hits. Even if the enemy gunshots fail to penetrate the 6B23, the armor cannot easily disperse the energy the impacting bullets transfer to the human body. Broken bones and internal trauma were frequently reported among those who wore 6B23 body armor and suffered combat-related injuries. These shortcomings are what prompted the Kremlin to replace the 6B23 with the Ratnik family of armors in the first place. However, complete Ratnik armors were few and far between on the battlefields of Ukraine. What happened? Typical corruption within the Russian military's ranks has proven part of its body armor failures. In 2021, a Russian captain and ensign were convicted of stealing 56 sets of body armor and selling them online. The captain got a sentence of six years and the ensign got seven years. Both of them are currently serving time in a penal colony. These two may have been made an example of, but they were hardly the only ones. It's common for officers in the Russian military to sell off top-of-the-line gear to line their own pockets. 
and then issue Cold War-era equipment to the soldiers under their command instead. The Russian military's body armor problems got much worse when Vladimir Putin announced partial mobilization in the fall of 2022, as Ukraine was pushing his forces back in Kharkiv and Kherson, and he desperately needed additional manpower. According to defense intelligence officials in the UK, the conscripts Russia mobilized in late 2022 often had no choice but to buy their own body armor because Russian armories were short. Many of the armor kits that these people and their families wound up buying turned out to be fake too. Those lucky enough to get their hands on real Ratnik armor often wound up becoming victims of theft, as poorly equipped Russian regular troops at the front simply stole it from them. The demand led to a boom in the price of any kind of body armor that even looked real on Russian e-commerce sites. Body armor, and we use that term loosely in this context, can now fetch up to $650 a piece online in Russia. This is a price that most of the soldiers in Ukraine and their families cannot afford, especially because a disproportionate amount of the people conscripted to fight in the autumn of 2022 came from Russia's poorer ethnic minority communities. Ukrainian soldiers who have captured body armor worn by Russian soldiers on the battlefield have often found such gear fitted with cheap steel plates instead of the high-tech ceramics, which are now designed to slow the bullet down to reduce its impacting force. The ceramic plates in high-quality body armor like the American Interceptor also fracture and deform the bullet itself as it impacts the vest. This fracturing and deforming in turn distributes the bullet's energy over a wider area to protect the wearer against blunt force trauma. While some armies use steel instead of ceramics in their body armor, this steel is extremely tensile and specially manufactured to stand up to small arms ballistics. The captured steel plates in Ukraine, though, have proven little match for small arms fire. Standard 9mm parabellum rounds were shown to puncture the steel plates on videos posted to social media by Ukrainian soldiers. Rifle rounds easily did the job. They are little more than steel sheets stolen from somewhere else and fitted into what was supposed to be body armor. Captured Russian body armor also seemed to be little more than a cloth covering to hold the faulty steel plates in place. This is in contrast to Western body armor, which is made from Kevlar and other fabrics engineered to be resistant to small arms fire and shrapnel or explosive fragments. The Russian armor, meanwhile, seemed like it would only be good against fragments or shrapnel in the area that the plates directly covered. Indeed, Ukrainian troops have been seen on video bending the steel plates in captured Russian body armor with their hands, feet, and over their knees. They laugh contemptuously as they do so. This equipment is probably not official Ratnik armor, but rather knockoffs sold on Russian e-commerce sites. However, one Russian conscript even complained on video that he was given a vest that would only be effective against an airsoft gun. It turns out that the Russian logistics brass opted to buy the toy replicas of Ratnik armor for their mobilized soldiers and pocketed the rest of the money allocated to them. Even if Russian soldiers or conscripts are lucky enough to get their hands on legitimate Ratnik armor, it is often not a complete kit. Corruption is so widespread in the Russian military that the ceramic plates inside the Ratnik vests are often missing, either to cut costs or because they are valuable commodities to sell off in their own right. Corrupt Russian logistics officers instead sold off the ceramics and replaced them with the cheap, non-ballistic steel plates that Ukrainian soldiers made fun of in the videos. The lack of effective body armor in Ukraine has proven devastating for the Russian war effort. At the end of August 2023, the Pentagon released estimates which painted a grim picture for the Russians. According to the US military, total Russian casualties over the 18-month war were approaching the 300,000 mark. This total included about 120,000 dead and 170 to 180,000 combat-related injuries. Ukraine, meanwhile, was suffering too, with 70,000 KIA and between 100 and 120,000 wounded. However, the Russians outnumber the Ukrainians by nearly 3 to 1 on the battlefields of Ukraine. There are many reasons for this disparity in casualties despite Russia's manpower advantage, but the lack of proper body armor is a big one. The Russian body armor industry is in such a poor state that the military is now turning to Chinese equipment to make up for its shortcomings. China has been reluctant to provide military aid to Russia for fear of Western sanctions, but some Chinese firms have been supplying their beleaguered strategic partner with weapons and equipment through backdoor means. Such aid includes body armor. 12 tons worth of Chinese body armor were routed to Russia through Turkey in late 2022. 
The body armor came from companies such as Xingxing Guangzhou Import and Export Company. Chinese companies have also sent component parts to Russian body armor manufacturers like Klass, although it's not currently understood how widespread the Klass vests have been used in Ukraine. Ukrainian soldiers have captured Klass vests on the battlefield too, although it's also unclear if these contain Chinese component parts. Ukrainian troops have been known to sell these captured materials online. Chinese body armor has been tested by American defense officials. This type of body armor uses aramid fibers, which are the same kind of fibers found in the familiar Kevlar vests used in the United States and other Western militaries. In the tests, the Chinese body armor's ceramic plates succeeded in stopping standard small arms fire, such as the 7.62mm round, from penetrating. However, the plates showed significant deformation. The deformation indicates that soldiers wearing this armor would suffer from blunt force trauma if struck by enemy fire because the energy would not be dispersed over a wide enough area. If Russian troops are looking to this equipment to save them, they will probably wind up being disappointed. So as with many other aspects of its military, Russian body armor looks great on parade grounds and in the Kremlin's information networks. On the battlefield, not so much, and the results in Ukraine show it. For Russia, anything that can go wrong does seem to go wrong, thanks to institutional incompetence on every conceivable level. Now Russia has plans for its next generation body armor, the Sotnik system, which the Kremlin says will come online in 2025, replacing the Ratnik family of armors. The armor was unveiled in early 2021, about a year before the invasion of Ukraine. The armor developed by Russia's state Rostec Corporation would be the most advanced and protective body armor in the world, if it works as advertised. But what have we come to learn about Russia's military's claims by now? According to Rostec, the Sotnik armor would be capable of protecting its wearer against small arms fire and even a direct hit from the 50 caliber Browning machine gun round, which can pierce lightly armored vehicles at a range of 2 kilometers. To protect against the shock of incoming rounds like the .50 BMG, which can transfer more than enough energy to kill, even if the bullet does not penetrate the body, the Sotnik armor will be made from ultra-high molecular weight polythene fibers. These fibers will be designed to not restrict a soldier's movement, even with the added protection. This principle works in theory because polythene is a plastic and plastic is light. But this raises a question, how can a plastic protect you against gunfire, let alone a 50 caliber round? As you would expect, plastics melt at high enough temperatures, including the heat a bullet makes as it transfers its energy to a target. The melting fibers adhere to the bullet and slow it down allowing the other parts of the armor to stop it from penetrating and transfer its energy over a broader area. Because of its heavy use of plastics, the total weight of a set of Sotnik armor will supposedly be reduced by 20 pounds from the Ratnik family of armors. All in all, a set of Sotnik body armor will weigh around 44 pounds, according to Rostec. And as if all the cutting-edge technology wasn't enough, Rostec says it will develop an active titanium exoskeleton to integrate with the armor in the future. Rostec is researching power sources for how this feature would work. As early as 2021, however, there were some military and engineering experts who were skeptical about Russian claims. Since ancient times, armor has always been a compromise between protection and mobility. Too much protection leaves a wearer immobile. It's why some units from then to now chose not to wear any body armor at all. For them, mobility was their best protection. Other units preferred to fight with heavier armor because they did not expect to need a lot of mobility. The latest question in this age-old compromise is, can polythene armor capable of stopping a 50 caliber machine gun round be made lightweight enough for a soldier to actually be able to wear it and not be immobile? According to a 2021 analysis in Popular Mechanics, the answer was not promising. For comparison, a standard 7.62mm bullet transfers 1,878 pounds of force on its target. A 50 caliber Browning machine gun round is over four times that, at 11,070. To put that into perspective, this weight would be the same as if a 5-ton truck were sitting on your chest. American military gear can stop standard rifle rounds like 7.62mm, with a total weight on the soldier at 22.6 pounds. This is a good compromise between protection and mobility. Stopping a 50 caliber round is a whole different story, however. That would take 1.25 inches of AR-500 grade steel plate, but this type of steel is far too heavy to comfortably wear. 
It would make a modern soldier the equivalent of a caricatured version of a medieval knight wearing armor that was too heavy to move around in. The amount of polythene plastic that would be needed to stop a 50 caliber round, even accounting for greater efficiency, would almost certainly be impossible to wear on the battlefield and remain mobile. Popular mechanics mention that Russia could try to compensate for this reality by adding titanium plating to the ensemble of a far more realistic amount of polythene. Since titanium is lighter and stronger than steel, the idea seems feasible. There is also precedent for it. Armorers in the Soviet Union made body armor with titanium components during the Cold War. However, even with this modification, stopping a 50 caliber round and leaving a soldier mobile enough to move around would be very difficult. The verdict about the idea of body armor reliably stopping 50 caliber rounds? Feasible, but don't put your money on it. It's also worth mentioning that 50 caliber machine gun rounds can easily punch holes in cinder block walls. Even if the body armor does stop penetration, dispersing over 11,000 pounds of force safely around the human body would be difficult. The blunt force trauma from the impact of a 50 caliber round would still likely be enough to kill. So even if the logistics to outfit all of Russia's soldiers with Sotnik body armor by 2025 work out, and there is every reason, as we've seen by now, to believe that they won't, the Sotnik still has a long way to go to prove the Kremlin's claims. If we have not learned to doubt those by now, we have not learned anything from the 18-month war in Ukraine. But what do you think about Russia's next generation Sotnik body armor? Does it even have a chance of living up to the claims the Kremlin makes of it? Let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Whichever way you assess the war in Ukraine these days, you'll probably be left wondering the same thing as everyone else. What on earth has happened to Putin's infamous Air Force? Fighter jets like this supersonic medium-range fighter-bomber aircraft, the Su-34, or this Su-57, a multi-role fighter capable of aerial combat as well as ground and maritime strikes, should be dominating the skies over Ukraine. But instead, they're either seen fleeing the battlefield or ungracefully falling onto the ground in flames. Try as they might, Russian combat aviators have failed to establish any kind of air superiority over the battlefield thus far. Today, we'll take a look at a few reasons why, starting with something called manpads. Don't be fooled by the name, these things have Putin's aircraft retreating left and right, and a quick dive into one of the most revolutionary periods in the history of military air power, the Jet Age. The coming of the Jet Age in the late 1940s ushered in profound changes in the field of aeronautics. Jets could fly faster, climb higher, and travel farther than their piston-powered predecessors, feats that would forever transform the commercial aviation industry. They would have major implications for military air power too. Jet propulsion was supposed to make air power king. If you could outrun the enemy in the skies, you could theoretically enjoy unfettered air superiority over the battlefield. At least that was the idea. Sound-shattering increases in aircraft speeds motivated designers to swap traditional guns for air-to-air -air missiles, their only hope of ever shooting a supersonic jet out of the sky. Missiles not only remain the preferred weapon for air-to-air -air combat, but revolutionize the very nature of air defense itself. Today, air defenses rely almost exclusively on surface-to-air missile systems, or SAMs, to prevent hostile air attacks. Impressively, technological advances in the 1970s made it possible to furnish vulnerable infantry with their own portable handheld anti-aircraft missiles too. Man-portable air defense systems, or MANPADs, are simple and cost-effective shoulder-fired rockets that lock onto aircraft using infrared homing. They can be taught to new users in a matter of a few minutes. Useful, right? Putin thought so too. Knowing Russia's numerically superior air force would play a central role in the opening phases of its invasion of Ukraine back in February of 2022, Western nations rushed thousands of manpads into Ukrainian hands to shore up their air defenses. These included American Stinger missiles, surplus Soviet eyeglass, and British laser-guided high-velocity Starstreak systems. The gamble paid off. Cheap manpads made it much harder for Russia's air force to establish aerial supremacy, imposing steep, asymmetrical costs on Russian pilots who could no longer safely approach priority targets in Ukrainian airspace. For the price of one $60,000 to $80,000 Igla, Ukrainian soldiers can down a $36 million Su-34 bomber or an $85 million Sukhoi Su-35S fighter. That's real bang for your buck. This has had real repercussions all over the battlefield. 
modern combined arms warfare hinges on effective cooperation between all service branches – air, armor, artillery, and infantry. Because Russia has thus far been unable to provide active, continuous air cover for its ground units, tanks, logistic convoys, artillery, and infantry have been repeatedly caught out in the open and destroyed over the course of the war. A spectacle played out almost daily in combat footage littering social media for the entire world to see. Here's the bad news, though. Despite Putin's failure to establish air dominance in Ukraine, this does not mean that Russian aircraft are not present over the battlefield or that Ukraine enjoys its own air superiority. Far from it. In a recent interview, Ukrainian troops on the front lines around Bakhmut told reporters that Russian aircraft still fly over the battlefield almost every day, sometimes a few times each day, but manpads have drastically reduced the extent to which they can linger over their targets. Here's how it usually goes down. Most overflights last only a few seconds. Fighter bombers flying in pairs or groups of four ingress to a target area at low altitude, maybe 50 meters or less, and then lob rockets and bank left or right and return back to base. Rather than hover over the front, far slower helicopters tend to operate similarly as airborne artillery platforms, approaching the contact line, firing their salvos of unguided rockets, and departing as quickly as possible. This has made it even harder for Ukrainian infantry to shoot down Russian aircraft. Constant vigilance is required since little warning is given. One soldier provided insight into the process. When the infantry shouts, incoming, and hides in the trenches, you have to run out and try to find the enemy's plane or aircraft. It doesn't matter if the enemy is shelling you or if it's calm. Your response has to be highly focused, and you have to have perfect sight and hearing to find a target at a distance of 3 to 5 kilometers. From the moment you've heard the sound, you literally have 3 to 5 seconds to run up and throw the manpads on your shoulder. Since timing is everything, concealed Ukrainians tend to target slower Su-20 fighter bombers and helicopters like the Mi-8, hefting an 18kg Eigler onto your shoulder while sprinting out to the open and get a lock while the target zips overhead, then launching the missile knowing you're in mortal danger all within a span of 15 seconds or less, can you imagine how difficult that must be? The decentralization of air defense made possible by manpads like the Stinger has helped limit the effectiveness of Russian air power, but it hasn't blunted it altogether. According to former Staff Sergeant and Green Beret David Bramlett, a combat veteran who recently spent 11 months fighting the Russians in Ukraine, Russia could still turn things around if Western support wavers. Let's hope that doesn't happen, but even if it does, there's a chance Putin will take care of his air army's downfall all by himself. You see, lucky for Ukraine, Russia also has its own incompetence to thank in part for its lack of air superiority. Recently, accidents have taken their toll on Russian aircraft, with six crashes alone registered over the span of two months in late 2022. In September, a Russian Air Force Su-25 attack aircraft crashed just after takeoff after entering a left turn. Experts believe the crash was likely due to a technical fault or a pilot error. The pilot did not eject. A month later, an Su-25 fighter bomber careened into the courtyard of an apartment building in Yesk, a western port on the Sea of Azov, during a training flight after its pilot ejected. The devastating crash injured 25 and killed at least 15 civilians, three of them children. According to Russian state media, the accident was caused by an engine fire sustained during takeoff. Just a week later, another Su-30 fighter entered a vertical dive and smashed into a two-story residential home in Siberia, killing its two pilots in a fiery explosion. It was the second such fatal incident in six days involving a Sukhoi fighter plane. No civilians were killed. But the crashes don't end there, and they are happening on a wider scale than you may know. The avalanche of accidents reflects the toll the war has had on Russian aviation writ large. Reflecting on the aerial crashes, Michael Bonnet, an engineer and analyst at RAND Corporation, noted that what's interesting is that even aircraft not involved in the Russian invasion are crashing. In an interview with Business Insider, he said that while mechanical failures are expected in aircraft over time, a rapid increase in fleet-wide mechanical failures may indicate that something fundamental has changed. So what has changed? The war has placed immeasurable strain on Russian aviation. Colossal losses contributed to Russia's tendency to adopt more risk-averse tactics, playing a subordinate role to Russia's ground troops, according to Guy Plopsky, an Israeli defense analyst and Russian expert. In just eight months, Russian combat aviators flew on average 150 sorties a day for a total of 34,000 combat sorties, but the number of sorties has greatly diminished. 
From an early high of 300 per day, Britain's Ministry of Defense estimates that now Russia probably conducts tens of missions per day. Very few of those sorties actually enter Ukrainian airspace. General wear and tear can be expected in any war, but the immense toll has seriously impacted Russia's pool of 7,500 relatively inexperienced pilots, who are said to receive roughly 100 hours of flight time per year, one-third less than their NATO counterparts. The lack of training limits their ability to conduct the type of massive air campaigns Western armies almost take for granted. According to Justin Bronk, an air power analyst, since Russian pilots are trained almost exclusively to fly in pairs and have little exposure to larger exercises, get relatively few flying hours compared to most NATO fighter crews, do not have support from tankers on most operations, and are not doctrinally trained for large air campaigns, it is perhaps unsurprising in retrospect that the Russian Aerospace Forces VKS, proved incapable of conducting a Western-style war against Ukraine. Of a pool of around 300 modernized and 400 other, frontline jets, Russia has sustained 72 air losses during the war, each costing tens of millions of dollars. The losses also include pilots, which are difficult to train and even more difficult to replace. Just ask Britain's RAF, itself suffering from a shortage of trained air crews, where it most recently had more F-35 Lightning II fighters than it had pilots amid a five-year waiting list for students to reach the front line. But the lack of qualified pilots is only one part of the problem. Russia also lacks skilled mechanics or the proper tools to make and fix the parts needed to keep Russia's modernized air fleet up to snuff. The fact that its pre-war stockpiles are dilapidated and rapidly diminishing only adds to the problems as the demand for specialized parts and repair tools grows. Russia has tried to mobilize greater amounts of manpower to address the human part of the problem, which, as you can imagine, has its own issues. Just like training pilots, you have to train the repair crews to diagnose and maintain extremely complex computer avionics and technical systems. That is, if you can get them. Herein lies another problem with Russia's Air Force. While mobilization certainly affected the small and medium-sized companies that make aviation parts, the random crashes and accidents began happening prior to mobilization. The shortage of manufacturing tools was already going on, which means Western sanctions may have had a role to play. Russia has been left in an economic and industrial vice by the West, squeezed out of its many traditional import-export markets where it has received the critical components it needs to keep its airplanes airworthy. Modern aircraft are outfitted with a deeply complex array of electronic systems. Computer targeting, special sites, communication relays, everything relies on critical electronic components previously available to Russia only on the import market. Moscow has previously admitted that it was 15 years behind the rest of the world, producing its own semiconductors, which isn't a good look when so many of today's precision weapons heavily rely on them. Russian manufacturers are now trying to source the components they need on the black market, but in the interim, Western sanctions and embargoes have forced the Kremlin to crack open stocks of its Soviet-era dumb munitions that lack computer guidance. Cannibalizing older pieces of equipment for spare parts is one way to try and stem the tide of aircraft losses, but it's hardly a good one. The result is an ad hoc, hodgepodge approach to combat aviation, hardly a combination any pilot anywhere should ever want to try. Some cases are pretty bad. It's reported that Russian pilots have been forced to tape commercial GPS devices to their cockpits for navigation, one report claimed. There are reports of Russian aircrews being so incompetent they leave the covers on aircraft sensors before takeoff. Another outlet claims their bombing accuracy has a mere 40% success rate compared to the pinpoint precision displayed by Western coalition forces during the campaigns in Syria and Iraq. We don't know exactly how effective Western sanctions have been in dulling Russian air power, but it has certainly played a role in suffocating access to the parts it needs to operate at the top of its game. In a war, every little bit of help goes a long way. There's no out-and-out -out answer as to why Putin has failed to establish air superiority. It is likely that a combination of factors, wear and tear, stress on older airframes, a lack of pilots and trained aircrews, and Western sanctions, have each played a significant role. What we do know is that thanks in part to their own outstanding courage, adaptability and resilience coupled with the material support they've received from the West, Ukraine has managed to do a lot with a little in terms of its own air defense. Talks are still ongoing over the feasibility of supplying Ukrainian aviators with Western fighter aircraft. If this were to happen, we shouldn't expect much to change anytime soon. 
Much like the implementation of Western main battle tanks, it will take months, if not years, to furnish Ukrainian aviators with the tools they need to become truly proficient on unfamiliar systems like the F-16, the Eurofighter Typhoon, the Assault Mirage, and other planes. That said, we should never again underestimate the pluck of Ukrainian service members who have a penchant for proving us wrong. Why do you think Russian air power is failing? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.